right? So I'm going to get going through these intro slides. Um, so not really sure what's on them, so we'll find out. Uh, welcome Linux Plumbers. Looks like sponsor stuff, so that's good. Um, info. Yeah, so Wi-Fi looks like the same Wi-Fi as ever, and then the code of conduct uh, stuff. Um, well, schedule, so I guess we start at 10 a.m. everywhere, which I suppose you should know because you're here now. <laughs> if you didn't know that, then you kind of missed it anyway. Um, yeah, it looks like there's lunch and then uh, some stuff tonight and not tomorrow. Um, I don't know if there's something specific I'm supposed to be doing. Okay, uh, upload your slides. I have not done that. We have an Etherpad for sharing notes. I don't know if you guys have used them before. There's a link to it uh, in the beginning of my slides. Um, yeah. Okay, and the planning committee. I saw Kate here. Did she disappear? So, <laughs> okay, there's there. So yeah, there are uh, people bouncing around. I guess with the green uh, necklace things. Um, so they should be easy to find. Um, okay, cool. That looks like it. I don't know if there was anything else I was supposed to say. Cool. All right. Now I got to figure out how to get off of. You want to just do it? I don't know how these things work. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah, cool. All right, so here is our Etherpad link, which should let anyone take notes. Uh, I guess one of you guys should do it for this one. Yeah, all right, cool. Yeah, don't know how to do that yet. So I guess everyone's just got to watch on the laptops or something like that. Yeah, that's fine. Um, yeah, so just a couple of slides on Unix class platform specification, uh, which is kind of the big spec thing going on in Linux land right now. Um, so this is a RISC-V spec. It's not an ISA spec, right? The ISA spec defines what the processor does, right? Like instructions and registers and you know how things execute and whatnot. Um, but it doesn't go and tell you about the rest of the SOC. Uh, and you need to have, you know, something to program against for, for the rest of that SOC. Uh, you know, we have some at Sci-Fi, so there's kind of this de facto set of devices that are bouncing around, and the goal here is to get the thing specified as a RISC-V specification so we can share all that stuff uh, between the various vendors. And so software can then run on everyone's hardware and that sort of stuff without a whole bunch of headaches in like early boot land. Yeah, so we're kind of trying to be ahead of the curve here, uh, a lot of other platforms have not really been spec'd out this early. Um, so we're trying to just nail down the simple stuff uh, so at least we can share all those sort of things um, before we you know, have a bunch of SOCs doing a bunch of things that are different and not really that interesting. Um, so there's a handful of things that are kind of definitely on the list, right? Interrupt stuff, bootloader interfaces, that sort of stuff. There's some gray areas, right? Uh, the cache management stuff has kind of gone back and forth, whether it's an ISA thing or a platform thing. Uh, we'll figure that one out. Uh, IPIs, there's no IPIs in RISC-V. There's some platform spec mechanisms to get to them, uh, and there may or may not be instructions at some point. Um, so we have a working group, so how RISC-V stuff works is you make working groups, they work on specs, they have some deadline, and at the end of the deadline you have to submit the spec for some sort of ratification process. Um, if it's a you know, fully finished ratified spec, uh, then it goes through a vote. Uh, if it's not, then it gets posted as a draft. Um, uh, right now, we are not trying to like do a whole spec, but we are trying to do something that is at least a you know, complete draft of a spec. Um, so we made that in March. Have a handful of goals. Idea here was to keep it fairly small, so we can avoid um, having too much complexity in the first round, just so we can get something out quickly. Uh, there are a handful of platforms that already exist that are doing things. So we wanted to just basically write down the simple stuff that's already being done so we can at least get everyone on the same page uh, and then kind of go from there. So there's a six month deadline for that, which means we have like three weeks left or something. Uh, <laughs> thought we had more time than that, so. <laughs> right? What? Yeah. Whoops. <laughs> so uh, hopefully we will uh, get some more work done on that over the next couple of weeks. That's uh, kind of my fault, haven't been spending enough time on this. But I think at least uh, during the calls and whatnot, we've more or less come to agreement on most of these things, uh, except kind of the power management stuff. Um, 
Okay, so talk through a couple of the goals we were having, right? The SBI stuff. So SBI is supervisor binary interface. It's the interface between the you know, supervisor software, which is like Linux, and whatever resident firmware you have running. Uh, so you can make calls out of the supervisor to do things like send IPIs, which aren't uh, part of the uh, ISA spec. Um, so this was originally not like a fully thought out thing. Uh, we just kind of threw something together when we were at Berkeley uh, so we could get the systems up and running. And it was largely there to cover the stuff that wasn't in the ISA, right? Uh, like IPIs and uh, TLB shootdowns and that sort of stuff. Um, so uh, we've called that the V0.1 SBI. It's all written down and spec'd out, but it's not really something we want to support long term. Uh, and so we're working on a V0.2 SBI, uh, which is extensible and whatnot. Uh, and that's now kind of largely finished. Uh, so there's some extensibility in there, the ability to probe for different extension sets, which have sets of functions. Um, that's all uh, up on GitHub. We keep all the risk graph stuff on GitHub. Uh, so it's up there as a document. Uh, so you guys are more than welcome to take a look. Uh, but I think we're kind of largely good uh, on that front. Uh, there are almost no extensions in it. We talked about maybe a year ago defining a bunch of extensions in the first round. Uh, we thought it'd be better off to keep everything kind of lightweight. Um, uh, so Plick stuff. So Plick is the platform level interrupt controller. Um, this was originally a sci fi spec and it ended up on a handful of other SOCs. Uh, so how interrupts work in RISC V land is your core has a single external interrupt line and then other stuff gets hooked up to that through some sort of you know, interrupt controller. Um, in this case, on SciFi's systems, it's the Plick, which lets you take a bunch of device interrupts and route them to a bunch of different cores. Um, so that was SciFi spec, got implemented, so we're kind of promoting it to a RISC-V spec. Uh, I think we've agreed that that's what we want to do, but the actual spec needs quite a bit of work. Um, so I, we kind of took the SciFi text and dumped it out, uh, but there's some ambiguities and uh, the figures all need to be redone and that sort of thing. Uh, hopefully it's not like a ton of work um, and we can get that banged out. Um, power management stuff, uh, yeah, haven't really figured out this one yet. So still arguing about it uh, on the mailing list and whatnot. Uh, there's a couple of proposals bouncing around um, of varying kind of degrees of completeness. Uh, it looks like right now we're probably going to go with something super simple. Uh, so previously in risc V land, all the hearts, so hearts are the you know, cores, the hardware threads, they would all just come up and enter Linux at arbitrary times. Uh, we've been told that's a pretty bad idea, so uh, we're going to change that over to like an explicit uh, you know, heart power on and off uh, scheme. Um, I think that's pretty locked in. Uh, right now, the arguments are basically, is suspend going to be part of that, or is that going to be another extension for more advanced power management stuff? Um, don't know yet. That's probably as far as we're going to go in this spec, just because any of the other power management stuff looks too complicated to put a stake in the ground on like a RISC-V standard right now. Uh, in RISC-V land, we kind of only try to spec out stuff that we know we can support for a long time, and it looks like it'll probably be vendor specific uh, for a little while. I think that's all the stuff I've got in here. Yeah, so I guess we can talk about stuff. I don't know if anyone has questions. Yeah. 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 Ye
I mean, we talked at the last workshop about going and redefining basically new versions of all these things. Right? All, all, I guess all the necessary functionality. And that's all fine. That's the new extensions and we can probe those. It's just the fact that you don't want to have to drag the legacy forever. So yeah, we need, but that was we the point of doing the legacy extension and putting the probing in there. So I think that I think no, but the, as far as I remember, the legacy part does seem to be always there. Well, the so old calls, I mean, the old uh, uh, SVI calls. So in V0.1, you have to assume it's there yeah. because there's no way to probe. But in V0.2, you can probe for it. Okay, that, that was kind I, of I need to reread the doc then. It's possible that we, <laughs> I guess I just screwed something up in the spec and sent something stupid that meant it's not probable. So that, yeah. that was uh, Christoph's point last, last week uh, on the list. Okay, I thought Christoph's point was that it was all one extension. I got confused too. I need to reread the okay. text. <laughs> well, I guess maybe we should all read it <laughs> because <laughs> I might be wrong as well. But yeah, certainly the intent was that they're all like different extension types that can be probed and replaced individually. We juggled the spec around a couple of times, but I, th I think that's how it ended up. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly the goal. If it's not that way, it should just be a matter of changing a couple of words. Um, but yeah, that's the whole point of the legacy stuff, right? Because if it's always there, we can't get rid of it. It's always there in 0 0.1, right? Yeah, well, that's fine. So there might be a sentence lurking from 0 0.1 that says it's always there. Um, but yeah, then we just need uh, something in Linux that says, like, yeah, you're not targeting 0 0.1, so you can kind of get on with it. Yeah. Uh, that should be pretty straightforward. Most of that stuff is just not going to get used anyway, right? We're throwing out the, uh, uh, whatever the console stuff, uh, which seems sensible. Um, and then the rest of it's going to get replaced with something a bit better thought out. So an another point uh, would be, how do we deal with going forward if we get uh, actual ISA instructions or register or whatnot to do things like TLB shootdowns and IPIs? So how yeah. do we support for it that, that doesn't require SBI calls? I mean, we've talked uh, through how the- How do you probe for that? So we talked through the VDSO, which I think is the way to do it, right? A function call for a TLB shootdown is not enough overhead to be worth worrying about. Right, so we just put in the SBI extensions, right, either by just saying, yeah, the legacy one fine works well enough, or uh, by writing up something better. And then we do a VDSO to get to those to make them faster. Okay. I think that's the best. I don't know if you have other no, opinions. No, sensible, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the only other way to do it would be to, you know, do some sort of runtime code patching thing where you patch out the e-calls with whatever instruction ends up in there. But that just seems like more of a headache than it's worth. Yeah. Right. Like the function call overhead isn't a big deal for a remote TLB flush. <laughs> so, so I, I think we're okay with something a little simpler. And that was the way the, all the SBI calls were originally. We got rid of it because people thought it was too complicated. But now I guess I we'll just put it back. Yeah. For IPIs, uh, can we make anything? No, but originally all of the SBI calls were defined as. VDSO type calls okay. instead of e calls specifically, so when you replace them, they could go faster with a specific instruction. Well, you can still have an e call within a VDSO function. Which is how they were all actually implemented, <laughs> right? Which is why we pulled it out. Oh, it's fall asleep. But I don't think there's anything to see anyway. So, uh, yeah, so originally, yeah, they were all VDSO type calls. Um, but then that seemed like extra complexity when they were all just being e-calls anyway. So we basically inlined all the e-calls and now we'll have to undo that. Sure. Uh, but that seems like the most straightforward way to do it. Okay, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has any platform spec stuff to talk about. Yeah, I don't see any reason to just hang around, so. All right, cool. So I need to figure out how to get this thing off me without making too much noise. Point anyway. Otherwise, I'm going to end up talking to everybody. What's up? Yeah, it's a button, though, I think.
on. Yeah. Okay. So next, uh, I'm going to discuss about the uh, boot process and risk five. So whole idea is to discuss the current state of boot process, good, bad. Then where are we going with in future? And then what are the problems? What are the ongoing things that need to be done? Hopefully, we'll have some takers of the tasks. We'll see. Uh, when around this time last year, when we started with uh, figuring out what need to be done. Yes. So when we start uh, started to figure out what needs to be done, there are like few objective, few objectives saying w how we need to fix the issues. So first, we don't want anything new for Risk Five. We wanted to make the boot flow as standard and as boring as possible for Risk Five. So we need to follow the exact same model so that any of you or anybody who follows a boot knows how to boot a ARM64 or x86 or for that matter, any architecture, they should be able to boot Risk Five without much hassle, without much of Risk Five specific knowledge. That was the whole big agenda to start with the idea. To do that, uh, there are a couple of things we need to solve. First is to have all the bootloader and firmware, which is upstream, open source available, open source bootloader and firmware support, get into Risk Five, like port them to Risk Five, and make it easy to port them to Risk Five. So one of the thing that need to do is we need to follow the almost, if not exact, at least the different boot stages that all other architectures follow. So with the multi-stage boot flow, we need to, uh, as in last days, the kernel also need to be loaded as in from a different media, like n network or storage or something else. For now, there is only one Linux capable board, so that has network or storage, so that's the only support uh, we are currently thinking of, but going forward, who knows what else we can support. But uh, the whole idea is to boot Linux kernel w without being embedded into the bootloader, so it can be separately swapped in, swapped out. So that goes with, uh, that helps with the CI setup, everything. Then second point was uh, easy porting of the existing bootloaders, I think something as boot you boot proper, you boot SPL, core boot, all, the, uh, all those need to, on EDK2, all those need to be easily ported to Risk 5 That was another challenge so that, as I said, everything as it works in other architecture, it should work in Risk 5 Apart from the bootloader support, the other issues we have, as Palmer already mentioned, all of the hearts already, or CPUs, Risk 5 call it hearts, so it's hardware thread. Hearts, hardware thread, yeah. It's Risk 5 so it has to be something different. But all, yeah, all hearts need basically jump Linux kernel directly. Like the previous days, bootloader just throws them into the Linux kernel and then kernel holds it at, at a variable and then basically it comes up at a random time. So we need to fix that to bring up a sequential booting so that one CPU boots and we know, let's say, it's an heart zero and then everything else basically you bring up one by one using SPA call or whatever other method. But it has to be sequential and in order so that in future, KXEC and KDUM can be easily supported without creating a big mess. The other thing is secure boot, so which I don't think we have discussed anything at all, so probably by next year, plumbers will have something on the secure boot. But for now, we have tried to address some of the first, well, first two points. Secure boot is for the future work. So before going into the details uh, of like how exactly boot flow is going, we need to fix the one specific part in Risk Five, which is basically SBI, which is different than other architectures. So we need to, we uh, needed to provide a abstraction layer which all library, all bootloaders or firmwares can directly use so that they don't have to implement it on their own. That was the whole idea of coming up with OpenSBI, which basically implementation of the supervisor binary specification, which Palmer uh, briefly mentioned. So it's BSD2 license maintained by the community and it's completely open source and well maintained and it's continuously we're trying to add features and address, add new platforms as it, uh, as it is available. And it's not only us, like whoever basically has a platform, they're trying to add support to it. So now it has grown to like, we started with KMU and Hi5 on list. Now it has 
uh, grown to have Andestec, Arian FPGA core, which is an FPGA core from ETS Zurich. And today I saw uh, Sci-Fi Bare Metal, Metal Library. Yeah. yeah, that platform support as well. So those are the platforms currently supported uh, in OpenSPI. The whole Kendrive. Oh yeah, I forgot about Kendrive. That's the <laughs> yeah, it's a six dollar risk five board available. So we have interesting talk at the oh, end that, of the that's session. My Come on. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah. So whole idea is to give a flexible way of all the bootloader and firmware to interface with it. So it can build as different firmwares, different uh, different firmwares or libraries. So to give you an example, how it's being used. Currently, uh, U-Boot SPL, Core Boot, and just the U-Boot proper are currently, ETK2 are using it. So the current boot flow, uh, so there are, as I said, there are different firmware, so current boot flow uses uh, U-Boot proper as the payload. I'll have more details on the next slide. Just wanted to give a brief overview. So as an ETK2 uses it as a library so that they don't have to deal with any f external firmware dependency while you put SPL and core boot is using as a uh, firmware where uh, they will load the next stage of OpenSPI, which is the last stage bootloader, and then they will pass on the address of that, and OpenSPI will just jump to that address. So those are the different firmwares that are being used. And I think I should have mentioned in the beginning, but uh, it's not a presentation, it's supposed to be discussion, so you are free to ask any questions at any time. So it shouldn't be one track uh, presentation. So any questions till now? There are mics, verbal mics, so. Okay. Yeah, so going forward, um, there are discussion, we had talks with uh, Core Boot guys where they're also trying to see if they can use it as a library instead of a, a dynamic firmware, or depending on their implementation. So they prefer to have one uh, control, uh, sorry, one repository of everything so that they don't have to support, uh, they don't have to wait for OpenSPI support for a platform and they can directly add some platform specific things in core boot. So that's how things are progressing uh, in OpenSPI and all the bootloader in RISC-V land. So this is how current RISC-V upstream boot flow. So when I say upstream boot flow, it means there's only one Linux capable board. So if you have a company who has a lot of money yeah, it can write, yes. <laughs> it doesn't have MMU, so it doesn't. I'll make a demo of it. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm kind of step wow. setting it up for you, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you just say that, oh, this guy said only one, and then this is the new one. You get, go and buy for six dollars. But yeah, that doesn't follow the boot flow, so no. I'm discarding for this slide. We have a version, yeah, so it's not <laughs> 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 Yes, okay. that's. <laughs> Yeah, so as I said, the only high five only stand can write, but yeah, okay, we'll upstream, deal with it. Yeah. yeah, upstream, <laughs> so we're talking about upstream. So you go to uh, mainline Linux kernel, download Linux kernel, download U-Boot, download OpenSPI, and then high five one list will boot on it with, uh, 5.3 will boot on it, or master will boot on it. So there was a couple of patches that went in in last March window, so eventually uh, 5.3 will boot on, everything upstream will boot. So the boot flow looks like, as it did, so the first two stages are zero stage bootloader and first stage bootloader, which is our sci-fi names and specific to hi fi one list. But going forward, I guess there will be something similar for every platform. Something like uh, for now, core boot and uh, U-boot SPL are basically trying to replace the FSBL and implemented hi fi one list. Uh, core boot has replaced hi fi one list specific things in uh, as in FSPL stage. And U-Boot SPL is only available in QMU, but going forward, that should be available if some of you basically go and port U-Boot SPL to hi fi one list. So go, next time, next is OpenSPI, which is only provides the runtime service as in SBI services. So that's the only job of OpenSPI, and it also helps other uh, bootloaders such as previous days like core boot or reboot SPL to depending on what configuration they want. Then uh, last, uh, so the next stage is uh, U-Boot proper, which is the U-Boot you know, you use for all other embedded platforms. So that's the U-Boot proper which boots in the S mode and 
open a current boot flow as i said is you boot proper is used as a payload directly to open spi so you give the payload to open spi open spi boots going forward in future there will be you boot spl loading you boot proper and then just giving the address to open spi same thing as core boot loading you boot proper or core boot may not want to load you boot it's up to the what boot flow you want to use for your platform or depending on vendor what they want to use and then you boot finally loads linux from as a network or like tftp boot or how you boot basically uses so there's nothing risk 5 specific in any of the uh, these components so you just use your standard tftp boot or boot i or boot m method in you boot to just boot linux so that's the most standard like simplistic but multi stage boot flow that we at least know of that works with other platforms so we are trying to get it done for s5 and it is done the that is not done is basically to replace different components with your favorite choice of bootloader so if you have a bootloader which fits in any of the stages go ahead and just do it should be shouldn't be that difficult so so this is just the, what i said is just an, in one slide where is the upstream status so open spi now it's the default in build root yocto open embedded qmu thanks to alistair and then you boot is uh, the zero uh, july release had a uh, complete unleashed support with smp and the uh, network support was also added in july release the next uh, you boot master works perfectly but the the next release which would be in october also has the mmc card so you can use the mmc card support uh, as well efi support for s5 is also available long time back and then you boot spl support recently added for qmu it's not yet available for hi5 unleashed so again just announcing go and do it for unleashed then next is core boot uh, that can boot on hi5 unleashed as well it's upstream you go to github core boot you can boot unleashed but they don't have smp support so you can get only one uh, core uh, coming up then grub support is also available upstream the linux kernel as i said 5.3 will boot as it is uh, whenever it is released it will just boot on hi5 unleashed with all the required features that are available on the board so you can boot open spi and you boot the big piece missing piece linux kernel is uh, the efi support which will let you boot efi binary efi complete efi boot flow on this 5 that's the big missing piece in linux kernel so this is all a small correction over here in you boot so uh, since there was a binding change in between from 2019 07 release to 2019 10 release so going forward like 2019 10 release is like the golden thing which follows the upstream bindings yes so that's the preferred thing and that's to be used yes so there were device tree it's like typical device tree issues where device tree were not merged in kernel yeah. but merged in you boot and then device tree maintainers had feedbacks on the compatible strings and something else and so device tree got changed it uh, <coughs> the changes went back to you boot but so that's why even though 0.7 wo uh, works uh, probably with now upstream kernel it might have broken so you probably better try the you boot upstream rather than the july release okay any questions Uh, so you said the uh, Linux kernel EFI support, boot support wasn't implemented yet. Is that in progress? EFI? Yes. Uh, we are trying to get it into progress state, but we got stuck in something else or other. So somebody, if somebody has free cycles, no. willing to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, because okay, like you. the grub support, I thought that was based on EFI only. Which one? The grub support for risk five. Yes, so it's on EFI only. So what else do you need? She's the guy. So I, I can I can Sorry? answer that. Part. Yeah, I can I can answer that part. Okay, it's fine. Um, so the grub support is is ba built around UEFI only. Yeah, and it can basically bootstrap into nothing today. Um, the only thing it can boot is it can, for example, run a, a risk five shell using the chain load command. But you cannot. The, the Linux boot command is a stub. It doesn't. It basically just returns zero every time you do. Okay, so it's a stub. Okay, it's um, because there is no Linux to boot at this point. 
So and it's not implemented yet. Right. And what's the upstream status of EDK2? Yes, I'm coming. That's oh, OK. So it's that, that's me. Yeah. Um, so that patch set is currently out for review. Yes. So the it's in the group IO stays mailing list, like whatever the mailing list is called. But yeah, I think the last two phases, DX, DXC phase and the where they need uh, e call to take some SBI calls, the S open SBI wrapper, those things are not there. But the PF flat pre EFI initialization and the, those stages are already in the mailing list. That's what I recollect. I might be completely wrong because this is what I got from the email from Abner. Yeah, th this was like last week, so. Yes. Uh, yeah, this is what I got from the email, so it might have completely wrong. But it is finally being upstream, so that's good. <coughs> cool. Okay, so this is uh, the, I'll come back to the, oh, there's another question. The mainline U-boot support now has SMP as well, because that yes. was missing for a little bit. Yes. It's, it's in as of as of the 07, or when did that land? So 0 0.7 had SMP support landed, or is right? Oh, no, 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 we missed. The, okay, it will miss by one day. So the SMP support patches just landed after 0 0.7 release. So those so are in master that now. That slide okay. is not correct. But ideally, you would go and try the master because of the device tree binding changes. Okay. So pick U-boot master, pick uh, kernel master, that should be golden, or whenever the release happens, 5.3 and October release. That should be uh, the one to go forward. Yeah. So, so I thought the EFI shim in the kernel was still missing. Is that yes, correct? Yes, that's what I said. Yes. OK, OK. So EFI stub in kernel is the big one that's missing now. OK. OK. So these are the all bootloader things and then what needs to be worked on. Uh, I'll have a, I have a end concluding slide with all the details what needs to be worked on. The other aspect, as we discussed briefly, uh, Palmer also discussed, is to bring up the hard CPUs one by one instead of throwing all them into the code. So for that, we need a power management or hot, hot, hot plug extension, which basically renamed of power management because we didn't want to have CPU suspend there. So that's the extension being proposed in the mailing list. So doesn't have any fancy stuff, just have three calls. One is hot R. So CPU zero comes up, brings up all the core, and then whenever you SMP setup calls, uh, when you need to bring up all the CPUs, you just call hot R, and then it brings one by one. And the same flow will be used in CPU hot plug when you want to do hot plug, like the uh, soft hot plug, not the hard hot plug from the kernel. Then, so that's basically will be an asynchronous call. And caller should confirm that if the heart is up or not, because there is no way it can confirm that heart is really up. Then the next one is obvious counterpart is heart remove, which basically asynchronous call and then it does the caller should not expect it to return. So it just it stopped. So for now there is no power management. So in SBI layer like open SBI will just do a WFI and just wait until there is an heart up or heart add call again from other heart. Then the last one is uh, kind of a query status. So whether the heart was up, whether it was down. So caller, this is since this is an, um, oh, there are multi SMP systems. So potentially the heart, heart of the status of the heart can be changed by the time this function returns. So according to the caller should be aware of that. So once we have these three, if, uh, so this is in still in the draft stages, it's in the mailing list, it's being discussed. Once we finalize this, we'll go and implement uh, all these things in OpenSBI, and then we'll go and implement it in kernel, like so that kernel can bring up, again, sequential boot, and then CPU hot plug. With that, at least we'll have booting flow sorted, like at least how CPU come up, that sorted, and then the boot flow kind of works now, like. So as soon as we have more bootloaders, EDK2, EFI will have more richer environment for boot, booting CPUs. But these are the things I wanted to uh, get a feedback of everybody. Does it make sense? Is it utterly stupid? We went a couple of times, and this is what the best we come up. So if you say utterly stupid, I won't feel bad. But, <laughs> but yeah, uh, any issues anybody sees with the call? And yeah, whoever not aware of the spec, 
So the, it, the return type is a bit weird. So it basically returns a struct because RISC-V ABI allows you to return two values like in A0 and A1. So we decided why not take advantage of that and then we can return like both value and error. So value would be a value returned by the function and error would be a global error you can return as a result of a call like this API doesn't exist or any, something like that. So going forward with SBA 0.2, all the functions will basically follow that uh, calling convention and everybody returns. If you don't have, the, if there is no global return uh, error call, so you just set it to zero and then return. And that's how we'll go and pass it. There's the GitHub link where the pull request is there. You're more than welcome to go and review and comment. But if you have any immediate comments, you can point out anything wrong, no? Or we just freeze it right now, right here. That I'll be very happy. We'll go and implement and then fix this mess as soon as possible. So the, to me, there's always kind of a confusion uh, with this hot plug keyword. Is it hot plug <laughs> or power management? We yes. had it power management in V1. No, because add remove, uh, frankly, I don't see any difference between that and power up and down. Yes, but we had that uh, detailed discussion and then Palmer? Yeah, then, then the add remove is really, really super yeah. badly named. No, because to me, reading this, that that uh, that means that the CPU present uh, uh, bits are going to change instead of avail or, or available. Which one is it? I can't remember. But one is going to just turn off. In even even though the, then, yes. the the heart is still there, it's just powered down. Yeah, that's why we had power management, but nobody liked that name. I mean. Yeah, well, but that that one is no better. So. Yeah, that's what. <laughs> it is. Yeah, but, but <laughs> no, no, but uh, I, I mean, that's important because there really are architectures where you can actually take a socket out without no, turning so down the, the no, machine. That's, so the always that's not what we're talking about here. No, no. So, so that, that's why it's bad name. No, that's what basically when you say hot plug, it's always the hard hot plug and soft hot plug. So, hot, soft hot plug, what you do from software? Then put a hard or soft. <laughs> you can't do a hard hot plug from a software. You have to actually physically remove it. But yeah, no, I'm open to any other names. So, but we need to fix this. So, yeah. any other well, suggestions? The are fine. It's the names are really super confusing. I know, but <laughs> so initially we had like hard up and hard down, but that's more synonymous with like power management API. Yeah. So, Pete uh, just said hard stop. Perfect. Whatever that means, no, what wise, it's up to the vendor. For the software, you start or stop. Okay. But what do we call this extension? Not hot plug? Just call it like heart state management or something. Heart state. Alex? Yeah, heart run. Because it's not power management, right? Because you're not doing like the clock stuff and the suspense stuff. No, the whole idea that's of. That's the problem with that. Name. That's that yeah, the whole idea of keep. The vendor specific thing. Whatever. You, yeah, I guess you. Like if if you down the heart, you could yeah, turn that it off, right? But it's not oh, all. Wait, the, yeah, it's not all the microphones anyway. Um, oh, you're doing one. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. No, I was just kind of rambling. Ah, it's good. <laughs> um, what, what I'm wondering here is, I mean, the, you're basically trying to add something like C state, more or less, as well, right? Mm. In, along the side. side. So in the long, like not in the long, in the long term. Long yeah, term. that's why we don't want to missing a latency target. Um, you, you want to you want to give a hint. That's the discussion in power management. Yeah. Because so it's not power management, right? Because no. you can't, you're not going to like but, but do the intermediate states. So when you when you call heart remove, you're really putting the, that heart in a reset state, right? It's not executing instructions. Yes, it's in WFS. Right. So what that does with the power is 
Who cares about, this is not relevant for power. It's whether that heart is in reset state or not. So you're yeah. either starting the heart, running instructions, or stopping it and stopping instructions. That's yeah. all this API does. I think is start and true? stop are fine names. Is that what this does? Yeah. Yes. Okay. The whole idea of initially coming up with a uh, rename, it was basically renamed from power management. Yeah, yeah, yeah. whole idea initially was to have it power managed so that down the road it will have actual power states in those APIs, but I guess... Yeah, so yeah. All, all this needs to do is say, I'm taking this, this heart out of reset, I'm putting this heart into reset, right? Yes, okay. and then whenever you call add, it just boots and you know whatever start address it's right. given. So by when, the when, you si when you call the add function, it, t it, it assigns, the p assigns the program counter and, and lifts the reset pin. Yeah. Okay, so and start is a, is a name or, or, or not reset or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah, find some name. But yeah, documenting what it does and, and says that in the documentation, it says this takes the heart out of reset state. And the remove says this puts the heart into reset state. For now, we'll just put it in WFI, right? Yeah, yeah I think it's probably technically not uh, reset. reset state. So it's not actually taking it into reset yeah. state? No, yeah. it's just WFI, so waiting for an interrupt. Oh, okay. For now. Existing platforms, actually, we don't have yeah, like there's a nothing power on and off uh, mechanism like for the sci-fi platform. So eventually, we'll see platforms having an explicit way to power it down and power it up. So for those platforms, we'll have hooks in uh, open yes. to implement. But if the platform does not have it, I mean, we'll have a software implementation, which will yep. be WFI based. Yeah, so just wait for interrupt and whenever add it back, just wake up from that. It will automatically wake up, so this yep. just jump to that address, switching the mode. Okay, so heart start, heart state management and heart start, start stop. stop. Okay, sounds good. Naming part. Yes, I'm all like, whatever name you give me, just let me freeze it so that I can go ahead and implement it. So, okay, so that's all I had now. It's all about what are pending, ongoing work, future work, and not some work that nobody's doing it. So, again. So yeah, uh, 0.2 specification, the spec is more or less finalized. So the patches are in the mailing list. There are a few comments, so I need to go and address them. Same thing uh, as a hot plug extension since uh, we renamed it to, we just discussed, so we renamed it to hot state management and then revise the spec and then go and implement once we have 0.2 implemented and then at least reviewed and reviewed in the mailing list. Then once that's done, next step is the sequential CPU bring up instead of all random jump in Linux. Next, EFI stuff, we discussed heavily. We need that for EFI support. Once the, and then in parallel, like these are different, and then in parallel, you boot SPL support uh, for hardware. That's required if you want to more, uh, we want to remove FSPL and have more upstream standard way of doing first stage bootloading. Core boot SMP support, that's still missing. We spoke to a couple of core boot guys. They are still deciding how to go ahead and do it. If anybody has experience in core boot, uh, can take a look. And then uh, EDG2, as I said, the project upstreaming is going on. So hopefully it will it will complete once we have EFI stuff. EFI stuff. And the coolest part is Orboot. So how many of you here uh, heard about Orboot? Not Coreboot, Orboot. Oh, there are a few takers. So Orboot is basically the Rust implementation of Coreboot. And this is the power of RISC-V. It's new, <laughs> recently developed, and the only platform supported there is RISC-V. No, that didn't work in ST1000. And it supports. I thought that didn't work, the ST1000. That's why uh, they switched maybe. to, uh, maybe. yeah, they were trying to find DDR control or something for HT1000, they didn't find, so they switched to risk 5 sci-fi, high five one list, and then it just worked there. It doesn't work on hardware yet, though. Yeah. You don't need to go into the details. <laughs> Let's get them excited. Get to take a look. By that time, it may work. So currently, there's code is a bit messy, but it's there. It's going. So yeah, that thing is, the, so anybody interested in Rust, go take a look at Orboot, uh, and then we are trying to add QMU what support and currently it's has sci-fi view support. Yes. So we're trying to add what support and open SPI on top of it so that you can yeah. boot any other last stage bootloaders. And again, secure boot, not a thing done about it. So any security experts, please go ahead and do something about it. Linux boot. Oh yeah, we for, I forgot Linux boot. That's also 
being discussed, but I don't think anything has been done. Was, was, what was the status? There's some VPN provider in Sweden that's funding <laughs> Linux boot support. <laughs> that's the same <laughs> You don't need a bootloader. Exactly, that's the point. <laughs> you basically... Okay, leave boot. it, yeah. No, so yeah, this yeah some like companies basically funding yeah. somebody to do it. I don't know the details. Do you they're know? We're gonna start once they get core boot up. They're gonna look at Linux boot next. So okay, it should come. Yes, and then any other fav your favorite bootloaders, please go ahead and write on this file. Um, anything else? Anybody wants to comment on bootflow in general? Yeah, you need to have. Um, there needs to be something in there for kernel boot arts. For the uh. Linux kernel, how to pass them? Some standardized way to do that. For uh, so passing kernel boot arguments. Oh yeah, okay. It's through DT right now. Well, yeah, I understand it's through DT right now, but. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just, just okay. making sure that that's standardized in the specs. Yeah, so basically, he's gonna pick, put it in the specs so that everybody follows that instead. Ah, okay. Yeah, platform spec. Yeah, okay. platform. So we put it in the platform spec. Okay. So we'd like um, Is it too much to ask to have a single way to boot both physical hardware, virtual machines, with measured boot, with secure boot? such that it works universally. Because like from distribution point of view, like supporting U-boot, supporting core boot, supporting EDK, EFI, especially since there's conflicting sets of features that are available, is a bit crap in 2019, especially since it's a new platform. So, I mean, you don't, I guess, you don't have to support all of them as in distribution. Sure, or yeah, yeah. yeah. It, pick your favorite one and then yeah. do it. Uh, so, secure boot, whole ball, different ball game altogether, so let's not get into that. But apart from that, uh, the way you can, so Gimu basically have easier way to do it, but you can, if you want to follow the exact same boot flow that mm -hmm. have on the hardware, it will exactly work on the same way, except the addresses might be different, and then how you load in Gimu, that different. But yeah, you boot and everything also works in Gimu, so okay. that will work in same as in Gimu analyst, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right uh, someone, Ben, sent patches to QMU to make the sci-fi view machine in QMU much similar to hardware. Um, and so that should be merged soonish. And so there's effort ongoing to make the same binaries run on hardware as on QMU. Okay. That's For the sci-fi view machine. The VERT machine is different. It doesn't match hardware. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, th yeah, that's yeah. that's the point of the VERT machine. That's so the idea is the same boot flow everywhere. And, and from a distro point of view, um, you, you always need to distinguish between what's delivered or supposed to be part of the platform and what's supposed to be part of distro, right? Um, I, I know we get a lot of these things wrong in the ARM world, um, in risk price <laughs> is, is no exception to that right now. Uh, but going forward, what you want to have is all, all the initial boot phase, that should be platform, a platform issue. You, you, you as a distro should not have to worry about it. Whereas, and, and the same thing goes for GMU. GMU will just get loaded with a, with an, a, a, a BIOS binary, something that you do on, a, on all the other platforms that just gets you into a standardized boot flow. And then you can just use UV, UEFI on top of that and implement whatever you like. I don't know. I, I want to control all the things and update them because uh, every year there are more security vulnerabilities going down further into the boot process. As a distro, I do want to update the whole firmware from ground up. And to be, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. But like, for example, how do you hot update all of these things in a secure way? Again, UEFI is the answer. That's all the standardized. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, why do we why do we start reinventing the wheel, right? It's it's all there. We we can update firmware from user space all the way down. Just call firmware, tell it to update itself. 
as long as there is some persistent storage like a spire flash on there, it, it firmware can just do it all for you. Why do we even have the discussion in this year? Right? It, let, let's just let's just implement all the standard ways that are there, and then still enable people with the freedom to replace all the parts they want to replace. Yeah. But in general, I mean, sure, today today this is all a toy, right? I mean, with one platform out there, one realistically <laughs> usable platform out there. Um, <laughs> With at least 100 MB of RAM, none of that none of that is is important because yeah. you 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 as a person scale to that boot flow and you can just do whatever you like to it. Imagine a world where we have 100 of those different systems and all of them are slightly have slightly nuance slightly, slightly nuances are a bit different. No distro is going to scale to that point, none. Um, so so we have to establish a way if we want to succeed um, the Risk Five uh, efforts. We have to establish a way to scale all of these pieces into the platform and not into the distro. Otherwise, it just would not scale. And I, I would, uh, I would just waste a bit more time co concurring with Alex because I've been known to be a, an opponent of UEFA in many other circles, but I've, I've learned better. And uh, as much as a lot of us agree that the UEFA code base is horrendous, uh, there are options like the U boot support, for example. Uh, it doesn't even ma matter anymore. Right? It has become the de facto standard. It does provide all of those functionalities, those interfaces, those APIs so s that uh, are critical for the distro ecosystem to be able to, to support the platform. And so um, it doesn't even matter what, whether your firmware is something completely custom with a veneer of UFI on it. What's important is the interfaces that it pr provides to the outside world. It, it's, it is, it is. I mean, there, there's a lot of confusion indeed, I, I agree, with between uh, UEFI versus EDK. And there are some, there is no known EDK UEFI really out there other than you would. Uh, there are various forks of EDK done at different points in time uh, of various quality. Um, but as I said, uh, it is the interface that matters. And if there is one, it's a standard, let's just stick with it. Yeah. Uh, oh, I just wanted to ask, you keep mentioning about U-Boot and Coreboot SMP support. Can't Linux uh, make a open SBI call and jump into the, it's like, is multi SMP support needed in the boot no, no, load? No, 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 no. Uh, it's not mandatory, it's just, okay. it's a feature, so. Okay. Yeah, so open SBI has an heart enabled, so you can choose how many hearts it, you can bring up, so, okay. so you can always change that per platform or depending on your platform, so. Okay. Um, so quick question, Alex. So once, oh, yeah, once we have EFI, let's say support, and then we can call it Risk Five EBBR compliant, right? If I am not wrong, uh, or no? Ah, uh, here, here. It you, you also need to create a patch to EBBR to mention Risk Five specifics. Yeah. So there, there is there's a section in EBBR that mentions what um, happens per architecture, mm -hmm. and currently Risk Five isn't mentioned. Um, so you have to also mention it. Um, however, the effort there should be trivial. Yeah. So once we have the yeah, that's the once, once we have a full UEFI enabled boot flow, um, going the, the extra mile to declare that EBBR compliant is just a matter of doing a new EBBR spec that also includes Risk Five. Okay. Yeah. That's yeah. Fine. So looking at it, it looked like it'd be possible. To, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Like poking around a little bit, it looked like it'd be possible to basically just add like the word risk five in there. It, that's pretty it much what work. it means, yes. Right. Um, so so we, we have a couple of um, specifics on, uh, for, for architectures like, what was it? There, there were a few things like, like how to do a hypercrawl or something. Um, there, there were a few, few nuances that are in the spec that are market specific, um, but in general it, 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 it all references the, oh, the other thing that you need to do is you need to make sure that the latest version of the UEFI spec actually contains the risk five changes. Is that true yet? I think it's still in draft. I think it's in draft. Yeah, there was there was one change for Abner that's in the UEFI spec that's to come out. That's, it, that's, to, that's to come out, right? So I don't, I don't think I don't think there is a re release yet. Oh, in Radam? Okay, so, so then you're fine too. It, it just, we, we have to have the, the boot path is in the UEFI spec basically, the, the fallback path is, right? Oh, those, yeah. those have to be in the spec, and th that was under discussion a couple months ago. So if that's in, in an environment that's already merged into the yeah. spec, then EBBR just really refers to, to the UEFI spec, so you all said. 
Um, it, but again, it's it's like just look at it for a day, look through the spec, look at what's what's missing, yeah, and just sure. do it. Okay, I think we are already over time for the next talk, so uh, I'm just handing over to. Uh, oh, you have a mic. Okay. Uh, clear, clearly. Okay. Okay, let's start. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Guo Ren uh, from T Head, which is belong to Alibaba Group. And before our company was acquired by Alibaba, it was called Cisky Microsystem. And I'm also the maintainer of Linux Cisco architecture subsystem. Today, let's talk about uh, IOMMU and introduce a broadcast TLB invalidate instruction for Rix5. And uh, first, uh, we, will have, we will have a quick review of some concepts of the Linux IOMMU. And second part, we will introduce a broadcast TLB invalidation instruction for the Rix5. And the second, we will introduce a light implementation of IOMMU with the instruction. And then, Mao Han, my colleague Mao Han will show us a case demo. And then, if, if time enough, we will talk about this instruction for suitable for the millions of devices. That means it's for the PCI or the virtualization situation. And let's quick concept review. And if you find, if you search on the Google or search on the, uh, find, on, find out in the documentation in the kernel, you will get some basic description of the IOMU function defined. First, DMA device can directly use virtual address without the need of continuous in physical memory. That means a little bit scatter, scatter gather capable for common DMA devices. And then solving the address problems of a device with limited address space. That means 32-bit address can use the in uh, 64 with the help of the IOMMU. And, and, and if, if without IOMMU, this device cannot access a full, full map, the whole system memory. And then devices are could, uh, isolated in different address space and protected from malicious devices and the firmwares. And uh, if we, we don't have the IOMMU, then the device, the DMA device could destroy any memory, system memory, and without any privilege protection. So it's a very important IOMMU for the system design. And uh, ideally, what I concern and I want to talk here is to, IOMMU should help a DMA device support all kinds of virtual memory messaging in Linux for the few mapping, anon anonymous mapping, swaps, migration, and the transparent page, page, page table, page page. And uh, I just concern about this because the above of this is not CPU architecture should concern. And, uh, and the fourth one is the CPU should concern because they share the page table, reuse the CPU page table. So let's see an uh, address, uh, address, uh, and address concept. Uh, VA means the virtual address, PA means, means the physical address, and IOVA means the virtual address used by the DMA devices, and IOMMU just translates IOVA to the PA. As it is the used by the CPU to identify different VA's address space in the TLB, and the IO is SID, similar to the SID, just used in the IOTLB. And uh, they could uh, mapping to the same physical address. Yeah? And if we don't use the IOVA and, uh, and let IOMMU reuse the CPU's page tables, then we call it shared visual address or shared visual memory. And the shared visual address, that's the two duplicate names for the same concepts. And uh, there are a lot of duplicate names uh, that confuse me a long time. And I will show you next. And uh, let's see some IOMMU kernel driver concepts. Yeah, and the device, device. Uh, and uh, it's a single device, not uh, uh, the granularity is possible for the IOMMU. And a group, group is the minim, minimum, minimum, minimum isolation of the, uh, of the in hardware topology. And uh, that means several devices you in hardware connect to the one group, and uh, this is minimum granularity. And a domain, domain, just the isolation of the address space. That means you can configure any group to any domain. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, in the kernel DMA uh, APIs, and uh, it's very nice. If you write your driver, uh, use the correct DMA API, that, and uh, you will use, you, there is not a, a lot of work you, should, you need to do. Maybe just uh, configure right DTS, then you can use the IOMMU with your old drivers. 
And uh, if you want to define, if you want to write a user space driver, and uh, V5 will maybe it's the choice, and uh, and it's the framework of the uh, user space driver, and uh, and then you can find a lot of tips on the kernel documentation, and here we just have a tips of it. First, uh, as a system administrator, uh, you should get the root privilege, and uh, you need, first you you need to unbind your oriented driver from your devices and bind bind your your V5 V5 drivers to that device, and you will get that group numbers of devices. And then, in the user space, and you will you could first in your user space driver, you should first create your container and then set group to that container. And is that con and in that container, just use the map DMA to map your IOVA just you want. Ideally, I mentioned again, we can directly use no more memory or and more mapping or few mapping, copy on right, and uh, I concern it in the this file. And uh, there are a lot of t uh, t terminology puzzles. And the last year, KVM Formula, Jacob mentioned the terminology puzzle between Intel and MTP SMMU, and you will see a lot of the terminology with the duplicate names with the same concept. Passive stream ID, passive table, content description table, PCI request ID, stream ID, device content table, and stream table, level, first level, second level, and a state one state. That so confused me a long time. And maybe we could add a third column next year in the five for the range. And, and, uh, and now let's start our topic. And uh, just, that's the preparation. <laughs> And uh, hardware, I, I want to introduce a uh, hardware broadcast TLB invalidation, yeah. And, uh, okay, when, when uh, currently Linux Risk 5 use software interrupt to flash remote host TLB with local flash instruction, and in the Risk 5 specific privilege specification, there's only the local TLB flash, that's uh, uh, defined defi definition. And uh, when we talk about hardware remote TLB invalidation, mostly we will think of the ARM's TLB invalidation instructions. Yeah, it's a very ARM smell. Uh -huh. Our company's CPUs also use this instru instruction. For example, uh, our 860 and, and uh, 910. And 860 is our 32-bit uh, and CSKY ISA, and uh, 910 is uh, RISC-5. Uh, 64 ISA and uh, 19 is a successor of the, uh, it's, it's develop, developed from the 860. And, uh, and uh, okay, let's take a, take a look out, out the, take a look at the parameters. And uh, th this is the basic parameters, the one we use the TLB invalidation instructions, virtual address, ACID. And uh, for ARM, and, uh, oh, not, not only for ARM, and, uh, Maybe if you support the, the hypervisor, you need a Vim ID, and uh, and uh, enough. That's enough. And then uh, what we different from ARM is we want to in uh, in addition about this to add two information of this. One is ACID first translation PGD PPN. That's that means this is related to that ACID namespace first level translation PGD. And the second is Vim ID second PGD PPN. And uh, that's uh, related to the stage two or level two translations. And uh, here, uh, there are some naming, naming puzzle. And uh, first translation abbreviated to FT from my view, my, my name, okay. And uh, second translation abbreviated to ST. So I didn't use the level one or stage, level one or stage one. And uh, FT PGD, that means first translation root page table, physical page number. And, uh, Physical page number available to PPN. Uh, that's not from my name. It's from RISC Five specification. And uh, before, before that, I usually use the PFN of the Linux. And uh, and I think this name is is okay. And the people are always crazy on the naming game. Right? And uh, and uh, and here I just use the uh, FT and ST instead of the uh, level one and the level two and the stage one and stage. Okay. And the hardware broadcast uh, TLB flash. And uh, in the 
if you find if you find out the uh, uh, risk five sp uh, privilege sp specification section four point two point one, and you will see see that uh, the definition and with the just the two parameters with VA and acid, and uh, and uh, today I and I want to introduce I want to suggest risk five to support a new uh, instruction and uh, it's the broadcast broadcast edition and uh, it, and it it also have the two parameters, but uh, they are, have different uh, combinations. And uh, for the par parameter one, it could be a uh, host visual address, uh, and uh, and, and it's, 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 it's visual address, and a guest visual address, and a guest physical address. And the parameter two will be have a more ID and PBA. This is the reused format of the SATP, and SATP is the risk five. Uh, spe privileged specification defi defined defined at uh, 4.1.12, and uh, it's a supervisor address translation and protection register. And I re reused this 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 this, uh, this this register is used for page table work. And uh, if you combine them together, and you will see when the model is zero, that means the first translation, and uh, the ID is acid, and the PPN is just uh, the, this S namespace, the first translation PGD PPN. Okay, PGD PPN uh, is the root page table. Okay, and uh, and the second translation, second translation is is uh, is model one, and model one will ID will be the VM ID, and the second se second uh, PGD PPN, and uh, that is for the hypervisor to maintain his shadow uh, second level page table. And why, and I will explain here why we need a first translation or a second translation in the instruction. And uh, first of all, we should say, ACID VIM ID uh, is a window technology to identify different address space in the TLB. There are a lot of styles to maintain ACID. There are some per pool, per, per, pool, per, per heart, per pool, and some all maintain them, unify maintain the ACID in the SMP system. But uh, but for arm smell, arm style, uh, they 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 would use they they just uh, use maintain the acid uh, together, and uh, I think we have some uh, mail list to talk about this and uh, and to um, and somebody have try have try on on this uh, acid maintain patch and uh, and and uh, and uh, but. It's hard to maintain CPU and I/O memory with the same pool because because the CPU system is constant switch. That means uh, that means his asset uh, that only one heart on a time just uh, run the one namespace. But for the DMA, for the, but for the DMA, but for the DMA devices, uh, that means in the I/O memory they they will be parallel. So so they, they are different. So they are different concepts, and they could not be maintained together. And uh, and and uh, now we introduce this. Uh, we need a unique identifiers for this address space. That's why I need a first, second uh, PGD PPN because this information is the unique identifiers for the address space, and their life cycle is the same with the address space, okay? So that's why I need a first translation and a second translation. And uh, window ID jurisdiction, and uh, ACID and VIM ID window technology is only suitable for the local system. So you can see here, the ACID, uh, the CPU just uses his local ACID and VIM ID, and the IO memory also uses his an VM and ID and asset, and that's the different system. And other systems maybe use other things that, but uh, but for the namespace, they can all use the PPNs, first translation or second translation to identify their namespace. So that's why we need a unique identify instead of the window temporary identify to maintain whole system's namespace. And uh, let's have a look at the SVNs VMA B behavior. 
and uh, use broadcast immune detection protocol. That's, that's the, the famous one is the SAE diffusion because I'm familiar with this, so I just use it to <coughs> for the example. And uh, and in this and in if you find the ACE spec if you look at the ACE specification you will you will you, you will first uh, got DVM is designed to operation read on the cache such as the PLB I cache or branch predict buffer and uh, normally DVM I, I just say ACE specification typically just uh, use the VADDR and ACDM VMID. And now I want to add two informations of, of add in addition to four, two informations. That will cause more transfers for one DVM transaction. In, in ARM uh, interconnect specification, several transfers compose, uh, one transaction is composed of several transfers. And, uh, and, uh, and before that, they are only need three transfers. And uh, with add new information will cost five, but it's acceptable for hardware design because it's not very performance sensitive. Okay? And the difference between hypervisor and on off, one, the hypervisor off, uh, as been at the instruction only trans transfer the VA acid and the FT PGDP on the interconnect. And uh, when the hypervisor is on, there are two situations. Guest OS, if, if it used the uh, S bands. VMA broadcast and uh, and then and then the, the, that uh, and then the uh, the first para parameter will be the guest virtual address and the second parameter will be the acid and the, and the first translation page table uh, PGD PBN and uh, and the hardware and the CPU will attend attend the VMA ID and the second translation PGD PBN. Uh, and then uh, there will be five transfers on the interconnect. And uh, for the host OS, and uh, if he want to maintain FT page table just uh, uh, with the VA acid and for the PGDP, and uh, if he want to maintain a second page table, just use model one. Here is the model one usage with the guest physical address and uh, VMID and uh, second PGDP. Yeah. Okay, uh, why we use the SPS VMA broadcast instead uh, to to why we why we I want to add this instruction because I want to use this instruction instead of MMU notifier, and if you find out uh, the uh, current uh, current uh, IO MMU driver status, you will find only Intel MD supported SVM. And uh, they and, and they don't use and they all use the software style to maintain the TLB and uh, with the callback. And uh, for the shared virtual address, uh, my opinion is IOMMU driver needn't take care about TLB invalidation because it should be handled in the architecture with the SBS VMA dot B. So that's my opinion, and uh, that's a different style and a little bit of arm smell. Yeah, and uh, let's. Introduce a light implementation of IMU to prove hey, that. Hey, okay, I have a question. Okay, um, so um, when you invalidate IOMU TLBs with an architectural instruction, you okay. are potentially introducing a very high latency in, into that instruction uh, because the IOMU needs to invalidate its TLBs and potentially also the devices have have their own TLBs which need to be invalidated. Yeah. Uh, so depending on the kind of devices you have, say at some s someday you have PCI devices, and they have their own TLB, you are probably introducing latency in the milliseconds range for invalidating all these TLBs with, uh, in, with an instruction, and in that time you block processor execution, right? Uh, you, you because, or, or is this instruction <laughs> asynchronous, or because basically when you have that kind of a latency for t uh, TLB invalidation, you need an asynchronous mechanism for doing it. And almost all hardware IO MMUs have such a mechanism for, or at least the modern IO MMUs have an uh, asynchronous mechanism for invalidating their TLBs, exactly for that reason, because yeah, you, have a re you can get a really big latency for that. So I'm not so sure it's a good idea to 
make an architectural instruction to invalidate the um, IOM UTLB, so yeah. Okay. Actually, I have more questions that we can really strictly handle in a small amount of time, but um, be very, very, very careful with hardware broadcasts of TLB invalidations. <laughs> uh, it's a Pandora box. Uh, architectures who've done it uh, for a long time, like PowerPC and ARM, can probably testify to some of the issues involved. Um, among other things, it suddenly become extremely hard to emulate load and stores from a hypervisor without racers. Now, thankfully, most of the time, those racers practically don't exist because it's MMO space, but if you do things like doing funky dynamic mapping of MMO space, you can no longer synchronize the translation with the emulated access, for example, while when you rely on uh, IPIs, you can hold the target of the IPI be doing the emulation, it's not going to respond, and so you don't have that race. Um, there is a number of other problems. Uh, when you start scaling to pretty large fabrics, uh, they become a complete nightmare in hardware. Uh, there is live block scenarios you need to avoid. Uh, they, are, they have the capability of bringing your persimmons down to a crawl. Uh, Linux has the ability to target specifically in validation to which CPU I've ever seen a given MMU context. You lose that with hardware broadcasts. You start basically hammering absolutely everybody on the fabric, and everybody on the fabric has to respond. Um, uh, our experience on PowerPC is that they are not that a good idea. Um, the second problem uh, uh, in, in that area, and uh, you just mentioned it, is uh, the minute you start talking to your devices, uh, some GPUs can have hundreds of milliseconds latency to invalidate the TLBs because they have gigantic queues that they have to flush. Um, uh, now, it is nasty to have to hook into MMU notifiers or things like this to do this asynchronous method which is very device specific and there might be some benefit in trying to invent some kind of architected uh, asynchronous mechanism. Uh, that would be nice. But I, the advantage with being asynchronous is most TLB invalidation, invalidation happen at task level and only basically affect the, the context that is doing them. And it's perfectly fine to schedule to other processes potentially, uh, or at least handle interrupts while you're doing them. Um, with the hardware mechanism, you lose that ability. So, force good idea, I would say. Uh, or works on small, scores, small scale systems, uh, but is not going to scale. Uh, at least this is my experience uh, with what we've been doing uh, in, the, in the world of, of power. Uh, but, well, before I left IBM. Um, there is a bunch of other things that pop to mind as you went through, but it's just a bit too much information in, in, in one go here. Uh, is there somebody who can give me the one single sentence reason why there is this uh, acid VMID changing at context switch, that sounds wrong. Yeah, hmm? yeah, yeah, oh, you have tiny yeah. assets. Working will be wrong. Ah, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I know. Okay, well, that, that's, that's a problem. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay I, I could say uh, you cannot say one thing is bad or one thing is good. And uh, if we, and uh, this is not forced to use in whole system. Maybe some system could use this to maintain TLB, but some system still could use the MMU notify to maintain the, with the GPU, with the some very yeah, uh, yeah, but expensive Linux TLB maintenance. Linux and, and you can use them together. Yeah, but the OS will do one, right? Okay. <laughs> the but OS will choose one and, and, and do and, one. And, that, and that's is a CPU vendor or uh, some, some, some architect some architecture selection, maybe, maybe they want to use yeah. use and it in this it way, like and you cannot say it's a bad way it because looks, it, it looks arm. fine until you just put a GPU in it and suddenly it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> uh, well. Okay, okay, and uh, and the next I will and next I will show show you how we worked with this mechanism, and this is it really worked well with our just what a quick thing as well. If you're gonna do that, you really must have some kind of bloom filter or something on your IMMU to do quick termination of invalidation of something that you do not have cached or do not have a tenure in the device for. Because if you, 
uh, because you are going to have a lot of TLB invalidation happening that do not concern any device. And those are all going to be slowed down as well, unless you have a very f a a kind of filtering okay. or caching okay, that okay. lets you know what has been checked out by the OMMU. Okay, uh, uh, let's continue to introduce the, my light, light implementation of IMU to show you how I use the, the style of the IMU is. And, uh, and uh, that's our maintain TLB way. And uh, we are not very pure pure use this way. Maybe we could compose with other ways together. And, and uh, from, uh, let's see, uh, from the MMU to IOMMU. IOMMU is very similar to the MMU. And uh, with the basic uh, MMU, CPU MMU design, you will see here, there is the JTLB with the Arbiter and the PTW with the SATP. And uh, with the, uh, and with the Arbiter, and uh, you connect to the U instruction UTLB and uh, connect to U data UTLB with the logical unit and the uh, instruction flash unit. And this is the uh, typically a uh, CPU MMU design and, uh, in the book. Okay. And uh, for the IO MMU, and, uh, it's similar, but a little bit different. And for the page table working, they are have different groups. Okay. Every group have his own page table root table, uh, root page table register to for the page table. And the second arbiter will be more complex <coughs> to be become an interconnect bit because it will cross the power and the clock domain. And then here is the group, group UTLB concept. And uh, I use group UTLB and uh, it's abbreviated to the GUTLB because it follows the Linux concept. So I, I just it seems like the ARM's TBU, okay? And uh, you can connect your IPs, IP, uh, MIP, MIP encoder, VPU uh, to group, and, uh, and then you set up your group zero. One group, and this is two group, and you have three group, and you can configure the group to any domain, and uh, with the domain zero and the domain one, then you have the two domain, and the two domain means two namespace, and they are namespace separate, they are, they are address space separate, isolated, and all of them, we can interconnect with the broadcast invalidation protocol. That's, that means I use the TL, that means I use the instruction, TLB instruction to maintain the TLB together with this. And, uh, and there maybe I can optimize, optimize with the, also I can optimize the performance with the local TLB flash. So I just, so that is the uh, IOMMU, the full concept. And uh, then, I can easily expand to the SMP with the, a lot of, uh, a little bit bigger systems. You can expand, here is the four hearts and four MMU with the, a lot of group, uh, group uh, GUTLB and, uh, and then you can expand your design to a very large, uh, larger, bigger. <laughs> and then let's have a concept of, of this simple MMU how to work, uh, how, uh, define. And there is a group mapping register. How many group UTLB, how many GUTLB you have? That's how many rows here you have. Every, every GUTLB is the same, it's the same with the Linux IO MMU group concept. And it's the minimum granularity for the namespace isolation. And here you can see you can uh, configure group, uh, group to the to the to the same domain, and uh, if the the same domain, you need to keep your PGD PPN the same with the ID. They, they, they are the same because they are the same namespace. They share the one page table, and then you can p you can use it here. Uh, the G GID index and uh, with a lot of uh, na namespace. And and uh, and each GUTLB has its own interrupt with its uh, interrupt context. That means one row means uh, one GUTLB and have an uh, interrupt for the page table and uh, you have its own con context. And the GUTLB duty, duty to K PTW and page fault interrupt control and response the DVM re request. And uh, GUTLB, okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Okay, I will uh, fast, faster review. Okay. 
Okay, okay. So uh, geotherapy detail is here, and uh, uh, and then is here. And the translation principle, for example, this is, and the general page fold, and uh, I will talk with you some the something like the Intel's the current states of it, and um, and there is no arms implementation currently. Maybe the patch is on the way, and then. And and then and I want to show you why why I concern of this situation because it is called not only saving the memory but also improve the performance and then we call the customized TLB perfect model with the soft transfer and then Mohan will show us the perf transfer demo here. Uh, perfect thing can also data can perpetrate with single line command and then there are varieties of optional variables and your basic decoding per thread man uh, perfect can also synthesize the trace output with side band information like context switch and the memory maps and the it, the output will um, record and uh, will combine the Properly record with corresponding process ID, symbol name, and field flow. And uh, the Intel PC flow can be constructed based on bench record uh, and memory map and the uh, origin executables. And uh, there are uh, some, uh, a few interesting chess modes available as an uh, architecture like uh, Intel PT, PTS, and uh, Cosi ETM. And, uh, the most straight common way to access them are perf kernel drivers and uh, external trace port. And uh, the perf is, uh, have, have a lot of uh, function integrated and uh, it's much user friendly and it doesn't require an external uh, trace device that can be quite expensive. And the format I use comes from the perf process trace draft and it use the info, info, it put the info jump in the branch map, which can largely reduce the record size, and the on info jump will require a differential episode address to record. And, uh, I'm curious. Okay, maybe I can read it out. Uh, and uh, and uh, he will show you the trace demo and uh, and uh, and uh, he he prepared this for for a while and this is uh, a uh, very simplest demo and I show you how to trace it. And you just type it. With minus E with 5PT for LS and then get a recorder for less than 0 0.2 megabytes. And uh, then use script plus C and uh, you can see different events and the, the raw data output. And the first recorder is a formula three with the episode address and uh, the following ones are formula one and they all get a branch map with them. And with perf script, uh, we can see uh, the, the branch flow of uh, the LS um, process and uh, the, uh, where the branch will take place and uh, which, which library is the symbol belongs to and uh, the target address here. And uh, that's all for the demo. Thanks. Okay. And uh, hello. Okay. And uh, why 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 we and and for 
and uh, our MMU also need uh, need uh, need uh, I O MMU also need a perf tracer because because we because uh, we need to detect what what the TLB perfect model is for the for the for the IO MMU is different from the CPU MMU because CPU MMU is a very local rhythm access and the DM access generally lacks locality and uh, but uh, but for the for the DM access it's uh, uh, the order of access is very regular so the preferred is the very important for it and how we detect the preferred and how we provide the modules and we could provide a probe counter and probe tracer for the users and the user could use these tools to de de determine w w which the which the preferred model is suitable for him and then he will customize minimize his hardware resource very minimal and and uh, and uh, okay, and in the here, in the okay, and here, and uh, for example, I will show you the usage scenarios, and uh, this is uh, this is our private products, and uh, we developed, it. and uh, it's brand Linux is very uh, hard to run Linux because it you need to reserve the thirty two megabytes for the frame buffer. I honestly think it wasn't a very help. And uh, I hope our IOMU solution could help this kind of products. And this only maybe $2, $2 cheap could run Linux with the uh, HD decoder. And, uh, and, uh, and this kind of IOMU, not only for the $2 cheap, but also for the $100 peak without virtualization. That's what our IOMU could provide. And then, uh, if, if, if we have time, we can talk about uh, is this style suitable for the millions of devices? And, uh, and that is the uh, 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 primary question asked, uh, GPU. Maybe GPU just used in the, uh, the problem is will be having in the, this kind of uh, situation. And uh, we have time to talk about this, Palmer? Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay. And the, okay. And, uh, and the day after, to, so and just, the day just after quick, tomorrow, uh, organizational okay. thing here. Uh, there is a whole PCI IOMMU VT miniconf, uh, which I think we probably have still space for subjects, and it might be a better place to get into a deep dive on some of those things. Yeah. Uh, Check with. Yeah. In, here the, in fact, I'm not very concerned. Con concern the PCI situation. What I concern because I want to add an instruction to the respect foundation, and I need a self logical consistency just for that. Because if I add an instructions proposal, that only could work a very small system, I, and and I think it also could work a large system. That is conflict with your opinion. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think. Uh, the if you're going to work on a large system, and especially a system that have high latency devices such as PCI, uh, where you do need to send the invalidation all the way down to the device, um, you need an asynchronous mechanism. And it's hard to do uh, at the CPU level because you don't want the CPU to keep track of the any number of async TLB ops uh, in progress. And so it's, it falls down into the category of better right. done in the IOMMU. That being said, Hi. There is something to be said about being able to do it directly from guests, and that tends to be more difficult to do with, uh, at the MMIO level because then you need N pages of control register that you can map into every guest. So there is a discussion to have around that, I agree. That is the problem, we should we call it too slow. That's the, that is the problem, we call it so, so we slow. Well, MMIOs uh, can be slow, particularly because you need a read to synchronize, but it's going to be nothing compared to the cost of sending invalidation down to PCI devices. Okay. Um, the, uh, so there is some discussion to be had and maybe invent something new that hasn't been done before uh, to, uh, to handle asynchronous uh, ops that 
can be done directly from user space, uh, sorry, from, from, from guest space, at least. User space is a whole different category. Um, uh, but, yeah. Whatever you use, users, uh, use software to invalidate in the TLB or use the hardware to use it, you finally you need to invalidate that TLB. So whatever you use, what kind of the style, you finally to invalidate that You do need TLB. to go to more and than uh, just invalidate uh, and you, TLB. And uh, you, the hardware latency just is cost becomes software, and the software will cost more latency of No, 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 it won't. So the problem is, if you, if, you, if you are asynchronous, you can do other things. That's a big, that's a key thing, right? Your CPU is not stuck on an instruction capable of scheduling, taking interrupts, doing anything. Um, t with IOs, you want large TLBs, right? especially in the PCI space. You're gonna have very large uh, data sets, you manipulate with things like GPUs. You're gonna need very large TLBs. They're probably going to be set associative, which means lots of sets. And the validations are probably going to require iterating every single of those sets. So we're talking hundreds, if not thousands, of cycles already there. Um, in addition, a TLB validation needs to do a lot more than just invalidating TLBs. It needs to flush all of the pending uh, load and stores issued that have been translated. So you have to flush all your queues. Now, I don't know if you ever worked with GPUs, but they can have very, very large queues. Uh, it's estimated on an NVIDIA GPU that a TLB invalidation can take up to 500 and 600 milliseconds. It's, uh, from a, a CPU perspective, on the par, we trigger a bus timeout and we blow up if we do that. Right? Um, the, so it's, it's a real problem. You really need to, to think about that. Right? And, uh, and I agree that MMO path is, has issues as well. Uh, and trying maybe to find something. If we're going to add new instructions to the architecture, I would love that if we could spend some time to try to think about the possibility of doing that asynchronously and what that means in terms of tracking, pending, asynchronous requests, etc. Because there is a lot of value in being able to issue those invalidations and go do something else while they are happening. So yes, the, pro the process that is being invalidated needs to stop, but other processes that don't share the address space can continue running, or at the very least, interrupts can be taken. Um, and, uh, and that means things like perf, continue monitoring, for example, and, and all of those things, right? While if you are stuck 600 milliseconds on an instruction, the amount of jitter you're introducing is catastrophic. You can end up with things timing out on your uh, network fabric, for example, and things like this. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. And, uh, and, and I, uh, oh. let me add to that that uh, with PCI, for example, in TLB and validation could also fail. When your device is broken, then you don't get an answer from the device and you need some way to handle that. And if you make it architectural into an instruction, then this would mean your CPU stored and yeah, how do you handle that? Uh, that means how 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 I how I invalidation the PCI uh, TLB TL, TLB entries. Yeah, yeah if the, if you send an invalidation command to a PCI device and it doesn't answer, so you usually have a timeout for that and uh, other AMUs will raise an error then. But yeah, and you can't uh, you can't complete your instruction in that case and. Well, yeah, and uh, some error returns of some sort. Yes, and it's an interesting, uh, it's an additional problem. You know, okay. TLB invalidation are tr intrinsically synchronous operations, um, in the sense that they they need provide a bunch of guarantees that are provided when the instruction completes or when a buyer after the instruction okay. completes or something, and you're gonna get errors. What do you do? Uh, machine checks aren't going to be nice if you can do it from guests, for example. So, it's yeah, it's part of the picture, absolutely. Um, the um, and it's gonna happen. PCI devices are going to time out. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe we can talk. Uh, mm -hmm. Have a more talk <coughs> next. Okay. Thank. And uh, very thank you for your opinions. Okay. And uh, the day after tomorrow, I will have an introduction of my architecture. If I'm looking forward to you to attend, join me. Next time, it's a lot of And uh, thanks for Atish. Thanks for Power. And uh, thanks to Linux Five Hundred. Uh, Microsoft conference give me the chance to present you here. Thank you. Uh, and a great organization. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Hello. Oh, hey, here I am. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> oh, great. So, uh, my talk here is about uh, use cases of RISC-V in HPC. And 
This may be a bit surprising because HPC is where we use the most fancy and advanced equipment. And uh, this is about why we want this and what's actually being used for in, the, uh, in high performance computing, which may be a bit different from what you are actually working on. Uh, what we are butchering it on with this and doing with this uh, will hopefully give you some insights. Um, so, um, what we're basically doing is we're using this for uh, HPC accelerators, uh, vector matrix processors, um, cost for cost and floating point uh, calculations, stuff like that. Um, as a multi-core processor, like the regular Intel things, um, that's really that for that replacement, it really doesn't work uh, because there's a huge infrastructure attached with it with uh, whatever, hundreds, hundreds of thousands of years of developer time to get that going. So that's not going to work. So uh, here's the difference between the classic HPC, which is basically Intel-based stuff, and the state of risk five today. In HPC, you will have really, really large scale, and in established legacy, you have about uh, three or four decades worth now of uh, software for simulations, floating point, uh, uh, deep learning, and stuff like that. What you have in risk five is you have a customizable, minimal, and easy modifiable core. And that's actually very important for uh, a lot of uh, use cases because the legacy overhead gives you so much uh, effort and so much uh, overhead that you can't really get to the essential calculations that you want. And you cannot really focus on the, the core mission of uh, your uh, solution. Uh, so uh, the advantage that RISC-V has here is that you can actually come up with innovative approaches. Uh, in the classic HPC, uh, you have a fully scalable operating system that's very complex to manage and you have a gazillion of tools that uh, manage these uh, uh, systems over thousands of nodes. Uh, that exists, doesn't exist in uh, RISC-V. We have an infrastructure, we are developing it, it's maturing slowly, but I think we are about three to four years away from that before we can actually replace a really uh, regular uh, full-scale HPC system here. In HPC, you have uh, established support for high-speed networking, for GPUs, etc., etc. All these things have taken long years to establish and to work on hardware interfaces that can actually support these high speeds and also require software modifications to software that requires these, these things. So you don't have that uh, in RISC-V. What you have in RISC-V is more bare bones, uh, bare metal processing technology. So um, how actually do you make use of RISC-V here? So uh, one use factor here is as, as a PCIe card. So you have these uh, large HPC clusters and you're gonna use the RISC-V processor to offload specialized compute or specialized tasks that can be done in such a fast way by the main processor. Uh, so this means that it's usually it's a PCIe card and the command and control works uh, as if this device would be a regular uh, red device with PCIe uh, and uh, stuff. So, um, what you have on the PCIe card then is you have the RISC-V processor, custom hardware, and uh, you have issues there mostly with the PCIe limits because you cannot really often push the data as fast enough into the processor as you want. Typically right now we have uh, PCIe 3 limitations which means you can kind of push about one gigabyte per pin into these accelerators. And what these PCIe cards have in addition to the processors mostly just local memory. Um, the other form factor is uh, as a network element. So the RISC-V is sitting on the network and connected to Ethernet. And uh, one, one gig channel is used for command and control and the 10 gig channel is used for the high performance compute. And uh, there we're missing right now 100 gig and 200 gig support. But it, uh, I see various solutions in the industry where the 10 gig actually is working quite well and uh, is allowing things that the other platforms so far haven't been able to do. Uh, in terms of software, uh, what is running on the RISC-V systems is basically uh, a minimal operating system or no operating system at all. Because and that also is an advantage because now you don't have to manage this complex stack that gives you latencies and behaves in unpredictable ways. So many developers are thankful that they don't have to deal with the complexities of the regular HPC stack. And so often, uh, if there is an operating system, you remove major components like the MMU. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> this means all the security bullshit and everything is gone, and you can just focus on the bare metal performance that you want. <laughs> so.
So, and what you do is usually everything, anything complex that you don't really, it's not essential, you offload to the main processor, Intel, and all the fast stuff is running on a risk five. Um, applications, yes. So you basically write custom applications for custom hardware. Uh, software is minimal, and you can explore new approaches. And um, I think this all is working right now, and it's going to be maturing as time develops. And I think in a, in a decade or so, we're certainly going to replace the existing uh, uh, schemes. So now back to the use cases. How does this actually work? Um, one uh, use case is just replacing the standard floating point ac uh, accelerators like the GPUs. You have new variations, new commands. Uh, there are various approaches that are creative and that actually can beat the GPUs in, in various aspects. And so I see a very rich infrastructure developing there right now. And uh, so uh, this is basically standard form factor. A GPU is just a PCIe uh, board that's put into a PC. And same thing can be done with a RISC-V, and you have much more flexibility and customizability. Also, since it is easy to just copy the RISC-V uh, code and do mess up your own stuff, uh, I see a lot of companies that just do specialized risk five uh, adaptions for their own uh, specialized needs. Every industry has a, a, a special compute that limits the simulations and, and stuff like that. Much. For example, here, biology, we have genome analysis and stuff. So here you can develop specialized solutions of accelerators based on risk five that give you uh, an advantage. And um, another use case is uh, as a network processor. Um, if you have a RISC-V unit that just does um, maybe 10 gig in, 10 gig out, or something like that, then you can do inline data processing. Uh, this is actually something that will, uh, will may increase the performance and the scalability of HPC significantly if we can get, get it under, under control. Right now, we have the problem in exascale that we can't move data fast enough. We cannot store data fast enough, and we don't have, to have enough capacities. If we can do the processing as the data flows by the system, and uh, do inline computation, basically, while the data is being transferred, then we can significantly increase the performance of future systems. And this is something that's quite complicated right now. But uh, in this market, I also see uh, significant risk five approaches to play around with these approaches and then to figure out how to do this in an effective way. Uh, so I just wanted to know if you saw uh, Risk Five replacing some of the CGA use cases today. Um, there is a very simple uh, replacement there. And FPGAs run at 400 megahertz. Uh, Risk Five processors can run at a couple of gigahertz, so they're probably a factor of 10 faster than an FPGA. So uh, Risk Five implementation can be much much faster and more lower in, uh, in processing than an FPGA implementation. It's a different skill set, but you are, on the other hand, you're dealing with directly with the design of the processor. You may, ha may have a much more advanced skill set than an FPGA designer there. And the people may actually cost you much more. <laughs> so it's not that easy. Once, once you have come up with the, uh, basically the basic instruction set or the way you want to code this, then you're fine. But you first have to develop the hardware and the processor with all the custom stuff that you want. And that is the challenge. That's it. Okay, any questions? Any ideas? Is it where? Yeah, it's working. So, wh where do you see the, the boundary between the Programming the software uh, that you put on the on the accelerator and the ISA extension that can potentially also be benefit that software. That is the, the, the nice thing about the Risk Five. It's dynamic and uh, and you can shift it any way you please and any way it, it fits you best. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any concrete example you have, you have uh, come up with uh, that, for example, you start thinking, okay, I, I need some ISA extensions mm -hmm. for doing these calculations faster by hardware, but you end up yeah. doing everything by software. Yes, you can, you can do both. No, I know we can do both, but uh, 
upfront without actually doing it, it may be hard to, uh, to, fi uh, to, to find out which, which one is going to be the best uh, approach. Yeah, so that of course, you have to think about this and maybe run some experiments and see what is best for you. So the, the vector extension of the ISA instruction set, it's still not ratified? It's still 0 0.7.1? Okay, maybe I can get a bit more into that. I think there are about five to 10 different implementations right now of various vector extensions on RISC V, as well as various vector processors. Right. So okay. uh, I, I don't think we need to standardize. We need just to wait which one is the best. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, really I want the, f the highest performance of this thing, and but it's not clear to me right now which one is the best. Let them all evolve, and the bad ones will die, and, and the best ones will survive. And as a distribution, I should optimize Atlas LAPAC for each one of them, right? And write custom assembly for each one of them. Yeah, and well, ship five of the, them. the problem is each, each <laughs> various one of them may have specialized use cases and specialized strength in various industries. So you may not want to uh, toss all of them, just keep one. Maybe there's a couple of those that are useful for various purposes. Yeah, I don't want to restrict the diversity here too much. This is also a strength of that the risk file ecosystem yeah, has. For, for like proper distro stuff, we will wait for the standards, usually. You right? Yeah. The, like, you know, the various vendors will be implementing this stuff over the next year or two, okay. and it'll eventually become a ratified standard. It's mm -hmm. a ways away. But if you've ever worked in HPC space, uh, you're building a computer for a customer who will run their software. Yeah. This whole distribution yes. thing is not a problem, right? But yes, this is a different perspective. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, we are not, I'm not thinking as, this okay, is not general I need to provide one unif unified ecosystem here. Uh, I have these problems that have to be solved, right? <laughs> and I'm applying various approaches until I find the best one. <laughs> yeah, so essentially you're going to build a distribution that runs on the base architecture and then your customer is going to come in and build their own software that uses the ISA extensions. Yeah. Right. This is not a distribution problem. And you know, like the blasts and whatnot will probably be done by whoever built the processor. Right. Or the customer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's depending on my, when I worked at Who HPE, cares? my customer wrote all of the software. Right? My customer and compiled it. And compiled it with their own compilers and yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's getting very Super bad now. They're building their own processors now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. And they're mostly risk five based. They, they they are not <laughs> budget constrained. Yeah, m many of these things are funded by the government, uh, either on the open or in the open or not. Uh, I, maybe, maybe, maybe I should. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so apparently I'm doing this. Um, all right, so who here knows a lot about the RISC-V hypervisor extension? 
All right, so there's not a lot of hands. So I, I guess I'll quickly kind of go over it and then we can talk about it. Um, so the 0 0.4 draft spec was released what, uh, two months ago. Um, so it contains feedback from KVM and lots of other projects. I guess I won't go into too much details. There's changes since then. So someone asked earlier what the spec's like. So 0 0.4 is hopefully the last kind of breaking change. Um, and from here on, ho hopefully there won't be any major changes breaking implementations. Um, and it's just additions adding on top. So you can see there's some list of of H time delta and a few other things we're adding. Um, so it's somewhat similar to the ARM BHG, if anyone has an idea of that. Um, and so WD, between the three of us, Anoop, Atish, and myself, we have an implementation in QMU, XVisor, which is a bare metal hypervisor, and a KVM port. And they're all, they're all based on originally on the 0 0.3 spec, and they've all been updated since to the 0 0.4 spec. So this is roughly how, well this is how your, your privilege levels look now. So as you can see, there's an M, well normally there's an M, an S, and a U. And so the S changes to a HS, where your hypervisor runs, or if you're not using a hypervisor, not interested in it, but your hardware has hypervisor extensions, where your normal OS would run. So your, an unmodified OS can run in HS mode and, and not use the hypervisor and doesn't need to know about it. And then your guest runs in VS and, and VU, and you still have a host user space. So it's yeah different to the, like the original ARM implementation, and so it was designed like this to work better with KVM style hypervisors. Oh, and and RISC five says V equals zero and V equals one is how they denote virtualization. So V equals one is virtualized. So. This is the, one of the questions I'm going to have with QMU, so I'll spend a little more time with this one. So the way we handle CSR accesses is originally there is an S something, right? So S status. And now there will be a HS version, so the HS status. Um, and that's just for the hypervisor. And then there's a VS status, which is the virtualized version of the S status. Um, so I have a diagram later that will kind of explain it. And the S status is then aliased to the real S status or the VS status, depending on your virtualization mode. So it works really well in software. So software running on the hypervisor can just keep going. But in QMU, it becomes a pain to deal with swapping back and forth between these. So obviously, a two-stage MMU is also in there. So there's no IO MMU in the RISC-V hypervisor spec. So there was a talk previously about the IO MMU. That's definitely something that needs to be done, but at the moment, like, this talk isn't talking about it. Um, so it's a pretty standard, just two-stage MMU. So it more or less just runs the same MMU again. There's not a lot of difference between the first two stages. Um, yeah, I won't go into too much detail there. It's pretty, it's all pretty sane and makes sense. And IO um, and interrupts. So there's no virtual interrupt support either. So your interrupts are all generated by your hypervisor into the guest. There's no, so you have to trap back and forward. Um, so that's something that also needs to be done, but again, is not part of the hypervisor spec. That'll go with the Clint. Okay, this is the, the one I need help with. So first of all, there are patches on list for QMU hypervisor support. So go and review them, <laughs> especially Palmer. <laughs> um, they need to be reviewed. So this is kind of what I was talking about before. So in RISC-V, there's an M status. And in QMU, there's no S status. The, a read to or write to the CSR S status is just a read or write to the M status mask. So and swap, and then in the hypervisor extension, we have a M status and a VS status and an S status. And swapping back and forward between all these is pretty nasty. And the way we do it now is with pointers. So we always, we change what we point to um, instead. So does anyone have a better idea? Of, uh, has anyone seen the, the QMU patches? <laughs> that doesn't help. <laughs> um, does anyone understand what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, there's a few hands. 
Do you want the box? Yes. Okay. And the box. And you left my laptop. Yeah, so um, I used to work on the, the VHE stuff for, for ARM as well. Um, and we've done the nested virtualization for ARM. And we have to deal with all of that stuff in KVM as well. And we initially went with the pointer approach of having a pointer pointing to whatever register set you're doing depending on your mode. And then you just change the pointer and everything else the same. And I don't know if that's what you're doing in KVM. That's what we're trying to do, but the problem is, so the M status doesn't change. So when you swap modes, I want the old M status with the new modes S status and put them together. So we okay. change the pointer, but then also have to deal with copying the old M status to the new M status. So what we eventually did was we abandoned that in KVM because it just it ended up not working, and you always had these strange corner cases where you were in transition you didn't know what was your actual state and made debugging, debugging an actual nightmare. So what okay. we ended up doing is that we ended up saying you have a special call where you say, okay, you, you basically say load and put, is I think what we put what we put them in, where you change from one mode to the other and it can only ever happen there and then you access all registers via in, via an indirection function that just figure out where it has to go. And so it was literally, we've been through all of the, the things for two years in an out of three patch set, and it was the only thing that worked. So I really didn't want to change the way we access them because that seems like a. So the yeah, we didn't want to initially either. Yeah, the the, <laughs> <laughs> the I real. Mean it's just my experience, but yeah. Uh, the yeah. the real problem I see with doing that right is that so in the CPU state in QMU, there's an M status register, and some person comes along in the future and goes, oh, M status. I'm just going to write to M status, and they do that and they break the hypervisor support because they didn't realize that they need to use this function to change M status, which then decides which one you go to. With a big fat comment that says do not access these oh directly. Yeah, but, <laughs> <laughs> but then no one reads the comment and it breaks and you, uh, you forget or you don't review it and it slips in. <laughs> yeah, but what if I'm on holidays and Palmer's on holidays and <laughs> someone just takes it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't like things that rely on someone remembering to catch it, right? That's kind of the pain. Um, Okay, so that's the other really fun thing is QMU has the MIP one, which is the interrupts pending CSR, and that has to be atomically accessed. So atomically, N has to swap based on the virtualization status. So atomically swapping that while keeping the old M ones and changing only the S ones kind of sucks too. And so I guess the same thing, like changing the access would help with that too. As a nod. <laughs> Any other thoughts? I thought Alex had his hand up before. Yeah. Ah, okay. Okay, so no one else has read the QME patches. I was hoping someone would review them <laughs> or say something wrong. Um, I think that's it for me. Now it's a noob's turn. Yeah, you can take over. Hey, everyone. Um, yeah, so coming back to the old slides, I mean, yeah, you're right. You will have the same challenges in nested virtualization as well. And uh, this is more of a software challenge, but the spec itself supports the hardware level parallelism. So you will have separate copies of uh, uh, VS status, S status, and M status. So, M so S status is nothing but a restricted view of the M status. Only certain bits are accessible uh, in S mode. So that's why we have these challenges similar to nested virtualization, because essentially this is software and serial code. So we have to do the software swapping. You, you have written M status, uh, no virt and mask, M status, M status virt and mask. So I really don't understand that one. Is it that there is underneath a single M status, you apply a mask that gives you the no virt or the virt version? There's a no vert M status and a vert M status. And the masking is only if you're reading or writing S status. And M status is the same no matter what virtualization state you're in. But S, the S status part of M status is different on the virtualization. Yeah, the background register, old, the old way, it was so much better. <laughs> okay, no, so I, I think I need to look at the code yeah. then. So even simpler thing, uh, there are like few bits in M status which are only visible to S mode. I mean, only S mode can touch only those bits. Okay, but now since we have a separate VS mode, the copy of those bits change. 
which brings the complexity. So in hardware, it's possible because hardware is parallel and you can have separate copies of this bit. But in software, we have to swap it explicitly. And MIP is a challenge because uh, same thing, there are certain bits which are for S mode only, uh, which needs to be swapped because this is software. Yeah, so, so coming to the the efforts on the hypervisor front actually. So since like for quite some time, the hypervisor spec was in draft stage and we really needed something to validate the whole thing. It is functionally complete and it will work perfectly fine for type one as well as a type two hypervisor. So we ported two hypervisors uh, and validated those things. And of course we found gaps and all those things. So we are uh, giving our feedback to the, uh, the spec community and also giving suggesting improvements on that front. So first one we ported was XYZer. It was simpler to do, and yeah, I'm maintaining that since quite some time, so. Okay, sorry. Uh, so it's a pretty monolithic, very simple bare metal hypervisor. Uh, everything running in one layer, and the Zen porting will be very similar to that. So you can think of uh, it, like how Zen would eventually look like. Uh, so the the color coding is like the pink thing is in HS mode, and uh, this is OpenSBI. Uh, yeah, we also have some changes in OpenSBI to handle the new privilege modes, HS and VS modes. And uh, the usual things, so the blue thing is the VS mode, and the, the, these colors are not differentiating, so VU mode. Uh, so mo even more interesting is how it works in the KVM world. So it, like he mentioned, it's already similar to the ARM VHE extension, but it's not exactly same in VHE, the host, uh, the EL1 register alias to EL2 registers, but in uh, uh, in case of RISC-V, uh, the aliasing is for the VS mode. So VS mo the S mode register access from the VS mode mapped to some other copy. So, and uh, otherwise it's quite similar in that. And the number of registers are much l less compared to the ARM world. And uh, the same, same color coding over here as well. Uh, so initially all the porting we have done with KVM tool. Uh, again, it was simpler to port it, of course. So we already sent out the patches for the KVM. It's there on the list. So we have like seven revision already there. So we'd be happy to get more feedback. And out of that, like we got very good suggestion from Alex, like uh, to support uh, migration across uh, the host with different frequencies. We need to have uh, multi-shift registers in CSRs so that we can migrate a VM having a timer frequency uh, let's say 10 megahertz to a ti another host with timer frequency of say 20 megahertz maybe. So yeah, we added, uh, we, we got the spec change to have a time offset, but we didn't think this aspect, yeah, that was a good feedback. And apart from that, yeah, so we also have a repo. Uh, since the patches are still in review, uh, I think, uh, so we have hosted them on GitHub uh, under KVM risk 5 Even a KVM tool port is there. So we have not sent out the KVM tool patches as of now because we are waiting for more comments as of now. Um, and we also have created a wiki how to play around with whole thing, how to build a QMO with the hypervisor extension support, uh, boot KVM on it and create VMs using KVM tool. Yeah. So having more detailed status, upstream status, so QMU patches are out for the edge extension emulation. Okay, uh, yeah, we need more reviews on that. Uh, Open SBI patches, one revision is already sent out, but again, we are still, we want to have uh, the spec uh, in a good shape, all things closed, then we can merge those things. Then uh, XYZ, we have merged it, but as an experimental, we, uh, so, and in XYZ, we detect at runtime whether the edge extension is available or not, so, so we are fine over there. And, but it's not released yet in any of the release. So uh, we'll let lit uh, wait a little more and then release it. And then uh, KVM, of course, we are waiting for more reviews. So please review and suggest if you have any better ideas, how we can make the KVM implementation better or maybe the spec better. So, and KVM tool patches we are holding off right now till uh, KV uh, Linux KVM patches get much because the ABI needs to be in a very strong shape. Uh, and extensible state so that we can port the user apps, uh, KVM tool and uh, si similar reason QMU K KVM, we have not even started yet, 
but we'll start uh, once the KVM patches are in. And once QM KVM is available, we'll do the revert as well as. Yeah, this is more detailed list of things what are pending as of now. So we need to get the 32-bit variant of the hypervisor extension working. It is exactly same as the 64-bit thing, only the register width change. And for certain registers, we have a H register, yeah. And uh, if there are spec changes, we need to up update the QM implementation as well. And yeah, and already the spec supports changing the X length, that is the register width length on 64-bit. So that is not implemented yet in QMU. So we can technically Q, uh, run 32-bit VMs on 64-bit, but we have not implemented that in QMU. And on XYZ front, we need to support 32-bit, then bring it up on FPGA, uh, like what Atish mentioned in the morning, we need to move to SBI 0.2 emulation for the guest, and also do the hard hot plug or hard state management uh, emulation. And if the vector extension gets frozen, then we need to virtualize that as well. And support 32-bit guest on 64-bit guest. And be a big Indian support is also there, but it's the tool chain support is not there. QMU support is not there, so we are blocked on that front. So once that is available, even we can support big Indian guest on little Indian. Yeah, and KVM, even a longer list we have. <laughs> yeah, same things, like we need a 32-bit KVM working. Uh, we need to bring it up, of course, on some hardware or FPGA. KVM unit test support we need to add now uh, because we, we, are, we are in quite good shape now. So same and SBI 0 0.2 emulation, we are emulating 0 0.1 right now. We need to move to 0 0.2 and also add other extension as they get frozen. And then virtualize vector extension in kernel flick. So in kernel flick is not that important as of now because the timer and IPIs are all using the CSRs only. Only the peripheral interrupts go to the flick. So as of now, it's not that performance severe, but eventually, let's say we have a flick V2 someday, which has hardware virtualization support, then we might end up with uh, in-kernel flick emulation. And QM, KVM support, guest migration, and all this stuff we need. Yeah. Any questions? Um, uh, you have you, you have implemented uh, first in the QMU yeah. uh, with the emulator, yeah. and uh, how do you solve the uh, memory problem? Because you have uh, you haven't uh, implemented the state two bit table, and how do you solve mm -hmm. them? You trap trapped uh, every load store with the exception, and uh, how do you solve the instruction in the guest OS? Uh, no, we don't trap the load store. I mean, so you are talking about the IOs or the you, you one, one two stage MMU, you are saying. From the guest OS running and the trap into the. Uh, so, what's the memory of the guest OS you use? Yeah, so that varies actually from user space tool to user space tool. So, you can actually, hypervisor can show any kind of virtual memory layout to the VM. So, the IP space or the guest physical space could be anything actually. So, that is programmed in the stage two. Uh, but you don't, but you haven't implemented uh, yeah, stage yeah, two. Stage yeah, it's. Uh, Oh, you, ha you have a stage two. Ha yeah. You have emulated the uh, uh, second layer table. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Yeah. That I needs I review. I so I someone should review it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 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 so you mentioned the vector extension virtualization. Why just vector extension? Just <laughs> any uh, just extension. An, just an example. Yeah. So we also have this custom access thing, like custom vendor extension, also possible. So for that, I mean, we might not be able to do that because the vendor extension could be anything. So whoever. Yeah, but as long as but that extension if it doesn't yeah, require if it's a, a, standard a mode defined change. Yeah, if it's a standard defined extension, we can virtualize it. No, I, I mean anything as long as you, it's just an instruction that does some calculation. For example, yeah. there is no mode change. What, wh where is the problem in emulating that? Just use it. See, upstream, we can only virtualize extensions no, which are. Of course, but. Uh, yeah, otherwise, offline, you can virtualize anything. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now, because there's fundamentally no problem in, in directly using that extension if there's no mod change, right? Unless that extension needs some specific CSR or whatever that needs it. Uh, yeah. So. Oh, uh, yeah. If you get a context switch in the middle or something. Yes. Yeah. Okay. We need to do lazy. Yeah. Lazy save restore or save restore, you okay. know, it's a dirty Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah.
So have you implemented the VMID uh, pool allocation? That means uh, uh, how many virtual machines you can support? It's yeah, limited so with the VMID. It is same as what you would ask for ASID. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, so you, you just reuse yeah, the so ASID. Yeah, it's very similar to that. Uh, so whenever you write the the uh, case paste table register, it will just uh, okay. flush that translation. So, so you need the uh, G, G and the U two bit for Jimmy this. just flushes everything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just in case. Okay. <laughs> so maybe a future we could be smarter, but flush all. You know, uh, I, I have talked about with the Gary Guo in, in the Middle East, we have talked about it. And uh, from my opinion, the page table bit is so limited, and you have only 10 bits in the page table. And you spend two bit table to, I think, a lot, a little bit duplicate. And one is G, and one is U. And uh, he said, and uh, that is for the nested virtualization. And uh, you, can <laughs> you can use the uh, G to as the uh, virtual machine's uh, signature uh, identifier. So I don't, I, I'm not very uh, understand his idea, but but uh, how do you think about it? Do you think it's worth to put two, to put a U bit and G bit in the, our page, ta page table attributes? That's true. I think uh, one bit is enough. We have to like, like I said, this is more of like a ISA level discussion, but I think, uh, for nested virtual line perspective, I think whatever is there is good enough functionally. But I know I don't know if it requires separate bits to distinguish between uh, a guest hypervisor VMID and the host hypervisor VMID. Okay. So <laughs> another question, may maybe to Palmer. So where are we with the specs? When when are they going to be finalized? Uh, yeah. And th that's part of my question. Yeah. Uh, c c can we get to a point where we can consider QMU uh, a full emulation of whatever is in the spec good enough yeah. for validating the specs? I mean, ultimately, that's not my choice, <laughs> right? I mean, I guess that's a question for Mike. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but okay, so as far as I know, Risk Lab Foundation says we need hardware implementations, right? So basically, the that the software has been implemented, and then that there's an FPGA implementation. implementation would be enough. That's right? fine. Yeah, okay. like it doesn't have to it be. Doesn't have to ASIC be ASIC doesn't matter okay. here, yeah. right? But yeah, like if someone was to go extend Rocket Chip to do the swizzling of CSRs and the second page table level walk, that would probably be sufficient. Okay. I think the goal here is really just to make sure that it, like <coughs> it is actually possible to implement in hardware. Like this one seems pretty straightforward. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> right? I know. There, the, the, but because it's pretty straightforward, it'd also be pretty straightforward to just go write the code, right? So um, I don't know. Unfortunately, like, yeah, it's there's too many things going on on our end to go do it. Um, is is there anything in the pipeline, like, you can talk about on record now? On record now, <laughs> no. <laughs> Does that a yes on like off record? <laughs> no. no. Yeah, as far as I know, we're not working. You can come see me later. <laughs> I don't have anything ready now. It's all on the the, KV, the GitHub KVM RIS5. It has QMU and KVM and x is separate, but it's all there. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. And the QMU cover letter explains how to build everything, how to run it. Yeah, it's all. If you can, if you use QMU and you kind of use QMU, it's pretty straightforward. So it's yeah. KVM, you can boot like one guest for now because it's KVM tool. With XYZer, you can boot multiple guests with SMB. Like and then they ping so each other. The and no, it's yeah. up to you, whatever you want. <laughs> I'm just saying there are options. Maybe, maybe, so. maybe I will uh, fix that. And, and then review the patches. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm excited, but I'm... But you should I'm make a t-shirt. <laughs> That's the problem <laughs> <laughs> everyone has. <laughs> As far as the open items in the spec goes, like there are three, four items as of now, which we like to get close, uh, critical for performance purposes, particularly uh, additional CSR for the trap information and 
is that uh, i think the trap in question says sir is more or less agreed upon and right it will it is agreed upon yes there is no more comments and it will be an optional thing so it yeah. will not break the existing some which is already there uh, is the malt and shift is that is not been brought up we need to bring that up okay and yeah and uh, i mean that's again like the time offset thing or the, uh, gas time, time offset tel- is agreed on in it's the it's merged also yeah, it's, it's, merged, it's in draft stage yeah so which is not in qmu any other suggestions how we can make this better <laughs> may I ask some question about the, the second page level you you have emulated in the QMU yeah. and uh, you know the QMU is the soft MMU in, in, in there yep. and the uh, soft MMU uh, <coughs> is the framework of the QMU and uh, you can translate it with anything but for the second second translation uh, I don't see, I, I don't, I haven't seen any other architecture have implemented the QMU software MMU with the second level translation. The you are Arm the first one? ARM does too. ARM does too? Yes. Uh oh, okay. I'm so sure. so it, it's can right? emulation on QMU. ARM has two page table level translation support in QMU. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. Doesn't Intel have it as well? I, I, I don't look at x86 Software, stuff. Yeah. I don't know. I thought I, th- I, thought, um, I saw I saw it in the ARM stuff. So it's not just us. So um, you just like I, I want to know some details thing. about yeah, it. Does how 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 you design with the S- uh, software MMU? How to compose the? If you uh, you need to change some page page, page entry because you need a type to di- different from uh, which kind of the uh, v- uh, virtual address index uh, a tag is. There are some 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 the entry could be, oh you just the free uh, TLB, oh open it. Wait, what was the question? Uh, I I means uh, how how do you how do you compose of your TLB entry because in the hardware <laughs> the entry okay yeah, but you could could uh, we don't could care. flash it. I just flush everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, mm. yeah, but for the QMU is enough. Okay. At the first uh, we, we don't sign need, uh, of anything. Yeah. TLBs. Yeah, we, we just <laughs> prove the CSI is right. Is that enough? Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah, but it's much easier to flush it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. And if you're interested, you could read the code and review it. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I, I should have time. <laughs> I, need, I need time. I have so much work to do. There's definitely there's QMU people at CSKY, so you could ask yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, we have QMU. Yeah. yeah, they're sending patches. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's. Let's get it in first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, I'm gonna be it. And um, we we do have tag GLBs and QMU, so you could tag it if you want. You don't have to. Yeah. Push, which basically, which I, I agree, it it is a proof point for whether um, the that's system is viable. Right? That's a good point. I. Yeah, it's probably more. I, I wasn't super interested in performance, but it's probably better proof than if you're looking if we do for work. Them. Yeah, but I'm never. I'm not looking for work. But <laughs> always more to more things to yeah. do. Yeah. Right? Okay, I'll add that to our to-do lists. Does wait? Does anyone else use that with two stages? Uh, the tags. Yeah. They're they're pretty new. I haven't looked at. Okay. But I, I I've seen discussions about them. Stuff. W- that's yeah. That right. I guess we would start with one stage and then yeah. look it help at us extending out if it like to two stages. TLB remote yeah, plug true. plug is software or hardware. That's probably worth doing then. Right. Because right now you can't test any TLB flushing stuff. Yeah. You need hardware, which is kind of a headache, right? And the ACID patches aren't going in because we don't touch ACIDs in QMU or the hardware, right? That's another problem. <laughs> but right now, like no ACID patches will be going in because there's no way to test them because we don't have anything that actually respects ACIDs. I just copied the CSI and the CSI. Okay. In your previous slide, you have to show that one somewhere. In your previous slide, you have to show you have put up in the hardware with the FPG and tell me how deep you have dived. There's no hardware. We want to bring yeah. up on the privilege side have a show say it's it says uh, we want to oh, we oh, okay, okay. Yeah. 
So if once someone somebody has, has hard, okay. hard APJ implementation will help to oh, you, you, bring up the software. We are software guys. Yeah, yeah. That you, you, you should, yeah, to, to let uh, hardware folks do that is... Yeah. Uh, Palmer just said it's not that hard, so I think he's going to do it. <laughs> you need enough, re enough reason to let him do that. Oh, there is software available, so that's more than enough. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a lot of folks we are thinking about uh, how 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 the benefit he could get or the what's the practice, the implementation. Well, yeah. So until the patches are merged, yeah, you are basically around with the wiki, the, the GitHub repos are there, and the wiki page. We'll add more pages as we progress, actually. We'll keep keep the work in progress patches over here. Yeah, yeah thanks. If no more questions, yeah. Two more talks. Lunch is at uh, one thirty, so we can. Yeah. We can go for early lunch. Uh, one thirty. We love our Linux guest comp. It's supposed to be over here. So oh, there it is. Oh, awesome. And it's doing it, doing <laughs> it wrong. <laughs> Solid. Oh, there it goes. Well, whatever. OK, whatever. It's just kind of, it's going to kind of work fine. Uh, my name is Keith Packard. I uh, recently joined uh, sci I work for Palmer. Uh, we thought that I would I could spend just a few minutes talking about kind of my experiences at HPE. Um, how many of you have actually shipped a non x86 data center machine? Well, that would be me. Yeah, not very many of us. Um, HPE actually sold uh, a, a moonshot uh, machine that was an ARM-based machine. Um, uh, more recently, we developed a research, a research vehicle called the Machine, uh, which was another ARM-based uh, data center scale machine. Titanium. Titanium, which was basically an x86 in emulation mode, and then you could run some non-x86 programs, yeah, yeah. Um, so, okay, so we want to move uh, the data center in some, in some capability to RISC-V. We want to get off of the x86 highway. Um, and go explore, uh, explore our new RISC-V utopia. This is a great road sign I found. I'm sure it's real. Uh, there's probably a utopia in California. 
there, certain, there certainly was paradise. Uh, it burned down. <laughs> um, what? Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so why would a customer want to go to Risk Five? Well, there's a couple of motivations uh, that we uh, that I discovered uh, we discovered at HPE uh, for why customers would want to move to a non x86 uh, a platform in the in the data center. Kind of the, the number one reason was uh, heterogeneity, just some diversity. Uh, if you have Risk Five machines in your data center, then they will not be impacted by the same hardware bugs that your Intel machines are impacted by. So the notion of having multiple vendors uh, providing your silicon source. Uh, gives you some diversity from, uh, from nation state attack, uh, attacks based uh, at the silicon, uh, from uh, zero days uh, that attack a specific uh, uh, bug in your silicon. So you get, some, you get some tremendous security benefits by having multiple architectures in your data center. Uh, another thing, obviously, we're looking at ISA extensions where you can, where you can go in and say, okay, I'm going to make some custom ISA extensions for my HPC application or for my data center application, and I can't convince Intel to put those ISA extensions into the silicon. But hey, Sci-5, uh, do you want to build a million processors for us? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so we can do things like that in, in a smaller architecture space that is much more difficult in a larger environment. Intel probably won't, yeah. And you won't either? Uh, probably not, no. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying, you know, I used to work at Intel, and a million was a kind of a small number. Um, another, another place where, you, where, you, where, uh, where it's interesting to look is, is uh, hardware customization. Uh, when we built the machine prototypes, uh, we needed to talk to a new memory, a new memory, a new memory device. Uh, it's a fabric-based memory controller. Um, we looked around for processor vendors. It's like, uh, hey, processor vendor, we have this interesting new memory system. You want to help us connect our memory system to your processor? Um, and we found an ARM processor vendor that was willing to talk. So guess what processor is in the machine? It was an ARM, because uh, we could actually talk to our new device. So the ability to get to very customized hardware uh, for particular application space is an advantage to using, uh, to using a smaller processor vendor. Uh, who's more interested in, in getting to interesting, interesting corner cases in the data center. Um, implementation advantages, uh, again in the machine, uh, one of the advantages that we found with the ARM chip that we had was it had uh, four memory controllers instead of three memory controllers. Hey, more memory bandwidth, that's good. Uh, sometimes you can get magic integrated peripherals. Uh, if, you want, uh, if you want a Gen Z controller in your peripheral, if you want a, um, you know, whatever other memory controllers or network controllers and you want them more tightly integrated into your processor, you might be able to find a custom silicon vendor with a RISC-V core that will do that for you or already has that. There's more variety in the ecosystem. You don't have a single silicon supplier uh, trying to make everybody happy all at once. One of the things we discovered that was really not relevant uh, in our exp explorations of the data center is the power advantages of a modern architecture over Intel are not as relevant in the data center. Uh, and the price of the processor is not really relevant in the data center because the data center, people who are buying a data center machine are looking at life cycle costs. Uh, they're looking at putting a couple of terabytes per socket into the machine. Uh, and so all of a sudden, your power and, and, uh, and price advantages kind of disappear. Oh, you spent $1,000 less on your processor. That's nice. Yeah, but not really, not all that exciting. So that's, that's kind of the customer. Uh, why would a customer want to do this? So when we start talking about getting RISC-V in the data center, I think it's important to remember why customers might want it. Uh, we all want it because it's a cool architecture and we want to go play with our new toys. Uh, but in the data center, the customers are a lot more value focused um, and we need to understand where their value might come from. Um, and so when working on software to bring RISC-V to the data center, you have a, co you have a question. Yes, I do. So I think I'll be quiet. Yeah. So you're saying power is not important? The, the power of the processor and the fact that the core uses a few less watts uh, is kind of lost to the noise of the overall data center scale uh, for. I mean, for us in Azure, power is really all the. Yeah, the system power. The yes, system power is very important. How but when you when many, you add many? when you add two terabytes of RAM to your system, then the RAM power is way more than your processor power. And also, like ISA's effect on power tends right. to be more noticeable in small systems. Right. right. In in these like you know. 30 uh, square millimeter, you know, cores right. plus L2s okay. that are going on here. Like yeah. it doesn't the really ice, ice, the, the right. effect of the ISA is very small on your power budget is, is the overall yeah, thing. Yeah, almost all of it's. The power is very is. important, but the power of the core right, right. is okay. not as important. That's what I meant to say. Okay. That's a good clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. 
Uh, okay. Uh, so there are some kind of differences between the data center and the embedded system. Uh, your refrigerator, as you know, it, it, they may look the same—a giant box with metal doors um, <laughs> and a lot of compressors. Yeah. yeah. One uses the refrigerator to cool the processor, and the other uses the, the processor to cool the refrigerator. I don't know. Um, so in the data center, what is the vendor supply? The, the hardware vendor supplies the hardware and the firmware, and that is it. That's all you get to supply. And uh, HPE builds the machine. The only software that HPE ships is the firmware. And above that, the customer supplies everything, right? So when you're talking about data center machines, the ability for the vendor to manipulate what the customer sees ends and begins and ends with the firmware. Um, the customer supplies all the operating system and applications, right? You're gonna go into a customer, they're gonna supply their operating system and their applications, and that's gonna expect to run on your firmware. So the, the interface you provide in the data center is totally different from the embedded world. In the embedded world, you're providing soup to nuts. You provide the hardware, the firmware, the operating system, and the applications, right? So on your refrigerator, the refrigerator vendor uh, customizes the operating system for their platform and for their applications. Uh, in the data center, you don't get that choice. All you get to do is build the firmware and hope that the application uh, and operating systems run on that. Um, in the data center, there's an immense amount of embedded management in the firmware. Uh, data, center, data center system vendors, uh, um, even places like Azure and, and Amazon, AWS, uh, they have a lot of firmware in there to help management of the system. So if you're gonna run a bare metal operating system or even a virtualized operating system, you need to be able to remotely manage the machine. And a huge amount of the value and value capture for a data center system vendor is in being able to provide an enormous amount of value add uh, in the firmware. Um, and, uh, uh, right, okay. Uh, so data center management, this is kind of where, uh, this is where um, we had, uh, when I was at HPE, what we focused on providing the customer was this rich firmware management environment, right? Uh, so you basically are trying to remotely manipulate, you know, 10,000 machines uh, from, uh, from three continents away. You never want to be able to, go, you never want to have to go into the data center and touch the machines. Uh, so when we're talking about developing Linux systems for managing and manipulating data center scale machines, the notion of ever having to touch the machine to do firmware updates, to do operating system installs, to do any kind of management, yeah, you can never touch the machine, and we need to make sure that's, uh, that's important. Uh, the, the, this management system is also a significant amount of the OEM value capture, and that's a terrible marketing term, but it's really true. Um, OEMs capture customers with their firm, custom firmware, uh, so you get a customer that has a firmware, uh, so if you have, a, if you have an in-house data center, um, and you have 10,000 machines, and they all use some custom management software to manage them, uh, having a vendor come in with a, with a different stack for management, yeah, that's not gonna happen because all of a sudden their costs go way up, uh, the customer's costs. Uh, so vendors see the ability to capture a bunch of value by providing, uh, providing a rich management environment that is specific to their hardware. So they're leveraging the, leveraging the ability to provide that, that uh, environment to the customer to get the customer to kind of stick to their hardware. Um, I don't know if that's great, but it's the reality of the data center today. Um, so uh, Linux is used differently in the data center, right? You're on an embedded device, uh, you, you build the operating system and the hardware and the applications all together. When you, ship a new, when you ship a new refrigerator, you ship a new washing machine, everything is built all together, right? And the data center, um, all you're doing is building hardware which is designed to run an existing operating system. So in the data center, the operating system comes before the hardware, and in the, in the embedded space, the hardware comes before the operating system. So we need to build, make sure that we build interfaces uh, in the hardware that enable an old operating system to run. Uh, how many of you are, are, you know, end up with customers that end up running a 10-year-old RHEL version? Yeah, yeah, how much fun is that? <laughs> yeah, he looks really happy, yeah, very happy. Well, it is, it is, you know, it's, it's really cool that we can actually make that work. Um, and how does that really work? Um, the, it works because of the way that the x86 market has, come, has grown up over the years. It's, it's much more of a bazaar. You walk into, you want to prepare dinner for your family, you can either go to the supermarket and buy a frozen dinner, or you can go to the bazaar and pick up ingredients from a number of different vendors and put them together and create a meal yourself, right? 
And that's what the data center is much more like. You're going out and you're providing, you're buying a BIOS from somebody, you're buy, you may be buying a motherboard, you're buying a processor, processor, you may be buying enclosures from somebody else, right? So you build, you bring all these components together and basically build your own machines. Um, whereas in the embedded space, you know, you're designing the enclosure, you're designing the power supply, you're designing the boards, you're designing, you're practically designing the processor these days. Um, and so this x86 market is in much, it's, it's a kind of, I like to think of it as a horizontal market where you go and pick up pieces from a number of different vendors and put them together. What that means is that there are strong and well-defined interfaces between each of these pieces and you can replace them. I can go, I can go to the uh, supermarket and buy myself a new PC power supply. I can go and buy a new yeah, GPU. You tell me yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but I, I can replace the GPU, I can replace the power supply, I can replace the case, yeah, you right? Can't put anything on the memory bar. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There's <laughs> places where we can't where we can't innovate. But it is um, another another huge advantage that, that some people don't recognize. I spent ten years in the open source uh, center at, at Intel working on uh, making Linux run best on Intel. I mean that's really an amazing amazing amount of work that they do and continue to do to make sure that when you buy an Intel computer and when you buy Linux, they work really well together. And we need to remember the amount of work that they do um, and, and try to emulate that in our own environment. We're, it's going to be very difficult because Intel has, you know, in, in, the, Intel's problem is that when you walk down the halls, you trip over bags of cash, uh, which makes it really easy to invest in, uh, invest in uh, long-term plans like uh, making Linux work best on Intel hardware. Uh, um, so uh, the last thing I wanted to talk about was kind of the x86 compatibility shims. Uh, we're doing a lot of this in the RISC-V space and we just need to remember how many levels there are um, in the x86 space, right? The initial, uh, the reason that the, uh, the PC market exploded in the 1980s was because IBM foolishly specified how the BIOS worked, right? Um, and so Compaq could come out and actually implement their own BIOS from the specifications um, and provide a, a machine which was 100% compatible with the IBM PC. I, IBM specified a software interface, kind of the first time in the, in the computing industry, a software interface well enough that somebody else could replicate it and run the existing IBM operating system on new hardware. Tre a tremendous feat. Um, we have that today still, x86 machines still have a BIOS. Uh, it's much less relevant now. Uh, obviously we have kind of a UEFI equivalent now, and I, I kind of put those in the same uh, bucket. Another, another place where uh, x86 has really uh, done some amazing feats of engineering is, is SMM. Um, it, allowed, it, allowed the, uh, it allowed you to plug a USB keyboard into a, into a DOS machine and type in your USB keyboard. I mean, that's craziness. And everybody, who likes SMM here? You, you think it's a great, it is amazing, it is amazing. Yes, the, the bear dances amazingly well. Um, at what SMM provides is the ability to emulate hardware underneath, a, uh, emulate the system at the hardware level so that software sees what looks like a hardware interface and yet it's emulated in software. Um, I don't know if we wanna go that far, but it's certainly an interesting idea. Um, it requires uh, ISA support. Um, uh, most people in the Linux space think it's terrible, but it has enabled us to get around some old legacy hardware uh, and, and move forward in the, in the x86 industry. ACPI, obviously, another great place uh, where there's some emulation and support capabilities that we don't quite yet have in device tree. Uh, the ability to actually put code into, into the ACPI tables and execute stuff. I've seen people do crazy things with ACPI. Uh, that uh, that kind of make your kind of make you uh, kind of make you concerned for their sanity, but it is the functionality of that programmable system lets you take existing software and run it on uh, new hardware, which is really important. Uh, you know, classic example VGA, right? Every single video card on the planet emulates VGA. Why? So that you can run DOS on it? Well, not really. So that you can get a text mode system and at least get the operating system installed. Right, so the goal of, the, the, one of the goal of the compatibility shims is to get to the point where you can install the software updates necessary after you've got the operating system installed. Uh, so that's kind of what I wanted to uh, remind you all of, the, just the number and variety of software emulation layers that exist today in the PC ecosystem that let us take new hardware and run old software. And that's kind of the real key. Uh, so so here, here's some of my thoughts. I think we've heard a lot of these already echoed today. 
uh, agree on a single standard boot path for Linux. Um, it's great to have a, a bazaar and a wide variety of ideas coming into the bazaar and thinking about different ways of booting Linux and maybe you know, what, what we should do. Uh, from a distribution uh, perspective, if you talk to uh, employees of Canonical or Red Hat, uh, they would like to have how many boot paths? Yeah, one. Yeah, one. Well, zero is, zero is suboptimal because then you don't boot at all, right? So it would be fantastic if every single Linux based, uh, Linux capable Risk v machine had a common boot path. Um, agree on common hardware interfaces, so we have some base level of interoperability. So if you want to talk to a, uh, you want to talk to the screen and the keyboard, there's got to be standard ways to talk to those devices so that I can always get to them from my operating system. Uh, we need, in a data center space, again, we need to be able to enable this value add uh, in, uh, below the operating system. Right, so uh, management systems and uh, emulation, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to call it, enable vendors to come in and add uh, management systems and data center, you know, uh, data center tools below the operating system, so you can uh, so you can manage an entire data center full of machines before they have their operating systems installed, um, and ensure that hardware variability, so that we can do we can have we can actually grow the system and move forward so that we're not stuck with ancient APIs and ancient hardware. Find some way of masking uh, hardware variability uh, below the operating system in the, in the firmware. Uh, and whether that's just you know, ACPI-like or whether we have to do something insane like SMM, I don't know. Uh, but we need to make sure that we aren't stuck with, uh, with, uh, with VGA as the only way of doing, uh, of doing uh, video stuff, right? Uh, um, ACPI now and UEFI provide a, a bitmap graphics console which everybody gets at now, and that's all emulated in the firmware. Uh, nobody sees how it works, right? Your video card has firmware chunks in it that the BIOS calls to initialize the video mode. It works okay. It gets to the point where you have a, a competent and reasonable installation path. It allows me to do things like a lights out console where I can remote the console from a remote machine because it's all emulated in the hardware. Uh, so think about these. I don't know how many of these are relevant, uh, how many ideas people have about where we can do things in this space. Uh, but this is kind of my experience from delivering uh, uh, non-X86-based data center machines. Um, I haven't spent a huge amount of time with Sci-5. I started in July, uh, August. I don't remember. Yeah, like, yeah, like two months ago. Uh, so I haven't been here very long. Um, I've been obviously watching RISC-V for a number of years. A question? Awesome. Um, comments? Yeah. Because I'm probably totally so, wrong. So. Um, I, I, I um, just kind of whinging and you're talking about the VGA and the SSM and the lights yep. out access. And, you know, I predate the Windows world of data centers and we had zero console, right? And, and most people in the room now, you know, know about this and, and, and it's always this educational pro problem through the 90s and 2000s of letting people know that actually that's the real interface to the real computer, right? Yep. And so did you really, to have VGAs on your data center ARM 64 systems? Why? Ooh. Why is it to fit into their their world? Yes. And they were running Linux. Yes. And they it, just so that was their operational mode. They had to have this because they were set in that mentality that that was what they wanted. Yes. In the data center world, when you want to go and debug a machine, you don't the the, the typical data center operation now. Uh, kind of requires a graphical interface. I don't know why. We all live on the command line. But oh, we all live on the kernel, the kernel dump list, yeah, which, which yeah, disappears yeah. off which which disappears off your VGA screen as it scrolls by. Yep. And the first thing everyone any any distro guy says, a data center operator, I need a real dump. Yeah. Hook up a freaking console and get me a real dump, not right. not a not a picture from your your phone of the dump, which is what you usually get, right? Yeah. Because of that. Well, okay. and, and, and maybe we can, yeah, maybe we, we can convince people that a GUI is not what they want, uh, but it, it often needs to be an option for doing things like installation, uh, for doing things like ma uh, maintenance and management, uh, because a GUI offers a more discoverable interface, so when an operator comes into a machine, they haven't seen this, this UI for six months because the machine's been running fine, the, uh, the GUI provides a way for them to rapidly discover how to fix things. A command line environment is much less discoverable, and, and, and when you're familiar with it, it's very easy to operate. 
but oftentimes a GUI is faster for people who only use it occasionally. So, so, so I want to make the contention that you're, you're right, but that we need to find some kind of a, a standardized hybrid net, network way to do ILO, which is not the same thing as... as um, um, VGA. As, which is not VGA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and is, it is, has a, something, something, you know, and I, I don't know, maybe it's a, maybe, maybe, maybe distros would be happy to s receive a, a PCAP capture of a VNC session. I don't know. Uh, well, but, uh, so but another, another thing that we've seen in some environments like, uh, like network device management right now, they have a web server. Yeah, they have so a web server. Right. Yeah, so, so I'm just trying to understand. Oh, yeah, that, absolutely. You know, there, it seems like we need, we need a, a, a standard, and this is a green field where we could actually define something yep. that didn't suck. Absolutely. So I, my presentation here was not telling you what to do with RISC-V. My presentation was telling you what is done in x86. Thank and, you. And, right? So yeah, I don't know what to do. Uh, but x86 is, has succeeded pretty well using, you know, with this hardware emulation stuff. Uh, and in, in growing from, uh, from desk side, desktop machines all the way into data center machines, and it's kind of crazy. But yeah, other questions over here? So um, I feel a little bit like this is a time machine from five years ago when we had some um, fairly uh, involved discussions about what this should look like on ARM. Yep. Um, and in hindsight, I think we've seen that generic ARM data centers hasn't really happened. Right. Nobody's really been able to do yep. that. But I think what we got out of that platform was um, okay, so look at AWS's um, ARM instances. By having a lightweight, not the crazy, but a lightweight um, ACPI layer, yep. Yep. what they got out of that was the dynamic reconfig and like hot plug add and things like that. So exactly. it's not the big crazy tall stack you need. You need the features that they allow. Um, I continue to be worried about what the hybrid looks like when, when um, cause the data center guys will mostly get it right cause they will live in their own pain if they get it wrong. Yep. The really um, concerning thing that we haven't quite reached on ARM is when we start to see the hybrid. When you start seeing the NAS boxes that are sort of like servers, but not quite, and they're yep. consumer products, so they do one build and then the sources are gone and all that stuff, right? So yep. um, I think so far, I think we're all looking at how ARM has done and they haven't driven it off the rails yet, but it, they, they're also they not home They certainly haven't player. hit a home run either. Exactly. Right. I, th I think our, our time is up. Um, it's time for the next session. But thank you very much for letting me chat. And uh, I'll be around the rest of the week if anybody wants to chat with me. Okay, uh, so small update on uh, RIS-5 NoMMU, uh, which translates into MMO Linux support, so on RIS-5. So uh, most of this work is driven, worked on by Christoph Harwig, so I've been, uh, I've been involved with him uh, uh, on this, but the heavy lifting is from Christoph. Uh, so, Quickly, I'll go through why we're working on no MMU, uh, ongoing things, problems included, and show you a small demonstration on the second world uh, Linux capable RIS-5 board. <laughs> uh, so, why no MMU? 
It's not just because we can. Well, we can, sure. Uh, but why is it interesting? Uh, so I can skip that bullet. I think you all know what it means, no MMU. Uh, in the device tree, that's MMU type known, uh, no virtual memory. Uh, it, it's been around for a while in Linux. Uh, it works on ARM and uh, CPC 47, uh, micro SH, extends, et cetera. A bunch of, of uh, uh, embedded processors uh, have supported that for a while. So that's not the same as usable Linux, just not to confuse anybody. Um, yeah, and so no MMU, what does it mean in, uh, in RISC-5? Uh, simply put, the S mode means you have an MMU. No MMU means you're running M mode. Uh, except if you read the spec of this guy. That's, they, they got it kind of wrong, but different story. Uh, he calls, so the, the SVI, uh, for example, C calls from S mode to M mode, but you can do the same from M mode to M mode too. Uh, so you could, uh, with the no MMU M mode Linux, keep uh, SVI specification, but we feel like there are low values there. Um, what did I write? Yes. Um, and so for M mode Linux, since we, we, we don't want to go the SVI route, so that there's, uh, there's uh, some things that, that need to be done directly from the kernel, not rely on any software uh, emulation uh, through SVI. So IPI timer, uh, et cetera, uh, all, all that uh, needs to be uh, changed a little bit. And uh, also some, uh, some changes to the user space support of the XO signals uh, uh, need to change, but that's more related to the fact that your uh, signal address space rather than uh, uh, it's RIS-5. So all, all this work is to make no MMU Linux work, but uh, the point is that uh, it's also a way of looking at Linux and, and, and thinking of, okay, if we want to support directly some hardware with Linux without having uh, overhead of some SBI calls, for example, uh, uh, or how do we uh, 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 work directly with some hardware through CSRs that we could eventually uh, stand, et cetera. This is also one of the goal of this work is to look at all these aspects. So it's actually V4, not V3. Ongoing work, so Christoph uh, posted V4 of the no MMU series uh, uh, about two weeks ago. So the main changes there is that, so we now have a config risp m mode, which it, uh, doesn't, uh, or what was it, config no MMU, I think it, so it defines to config no MMU. Uh, we also added a config risp SBI that allows disabling uh, completely SBI calls. So, all the CSRs are command, common between S mode and M mode. Uh, Linux being S mode normally, uh, you will still have to use most of those CSR in the exact same way, but instead of the S version, you will use the M version. So instead of writing entire code, uh, it was just written the way that uh, you call those CSR X something, and uh, based on uh, RIS-5 M mode, uh, configuration, it maps into the S version or the M version. So that simplifies uh, a lot of the uh, code. You don't have to change everything. Uh, so again, SBI calls are completely uh, disabled. Uh, some refactorization of the, the and optimization of the IPA code went in uh, all through MMIO, so no SBI again. Uh, obviously, uh, paging disabled and some VDA suffixes too. Uh, so end result is that that allows bare metal boot of Linux. There's actually no bootloader in the way. You can directly load an image at uh, eight something uh, seven zeros address and start from there, directly jumping into head.s first instruction. There's no runtime trigger, no nothing. And uh, we also added a, a new def config file for this. Uh, so that runs on QMU command line example here. So QMU has an MMU, it's just not being used with this, uh, this, this, uh, this code. Yes? You can turn the MMU off in QMU as well. Okay, we can, we can try that. 
It's never been tested, so it'd be good testing. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so you can dynam you can dynamically turn it off on yeah, the burp machine. So just to be yeah. sure that there's no funky yeah. thing going on. Okay, yeah, uh, we can try that. Uh, user space, so that's where more of the problems are. So current work re relies on uh, utility uh, flat binary format. FDP, uh, the real relocatable executable support is just nowhere to be seen. Uh, main problem is the relocation, so I haven't quite figured out yet what's wrong there, but uh, uh, yeah, it's not working, nowhere. So muscle C, UCLC, any, uh, any C library just doesn't work. So on the kernel side, it was kind of easy to fix. So the FDP, for obvious reason, there's only a CD2B version of it because most, if not all, I think, uh, no MMU uh, architectures, uh, architectures that support NoMMU in Linux are 32 bits. So we come up with 3564 and we said no MMU, which until now uh, did not make really much sense, but that's uh, that's what we have. So fixing the, the loader, uh, FDP loader for being 64 bit is actually quite easy to do. So we have patches for that. Uh, but again, the library side of things, the loader uh, just doesn't work. Uh, so Christoph has a couple of trees. Uh, so for the kernel, uh, that's not a dot two, that's a dot four, this late, latest version. Uh, and also a build root uh, uh, image with a couple of fixes to, uh, to build the user space image for, for all this. So screenshot, that's on, you know, no, that's the early work I did for debugging at the peak. All, all I could get to work is a simple hello world uh, uh, program as the init. Huh? What? Uh, I can't, so I haven't touched this thing in five months. <laughs> so uh, I can't remember exactly what I did. I can't actually right now replicate this. I, ca I cannot, I just lost the code just in limbo. But just to say, uh, I got that to work, but I'm just being lucky because anything else just breaks horribly. Uh, Nothing works uh, here yet. And again, I haven't spent much time there. So much better with the uh, flat bins, uh, easier to support. Uh, the loading is just basically just whatever address you load. And Sorry, what? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, how do you do that? Cut? Huh? How do you do that? The, the bash? How do you run the bash? That's busy box. Bitbox and how do you load uh, but static linked? Huh? Static link? Static link? No. Dynamic link? But no, it's, you can't, well, no, it's uh, it's a bin flat format. So everything is compiled from a start address, whatever, and it's relative to the loading address of the, the binary. Oh, okay. So you load that program forks and loads at whatever address uh, the, the process has uh -oh. and Start running oh, oh, relating to that address. That's okay, the flat format. J just, just like the kernel to call a function. Sorry, the? Just like a kernel to call a function. The kernel what? Uh, to call a function. You and uh, y this bash is not implemented by the LDSO. The basic the basic book the no. basic no, is okay. no, no. It's it's just a bin flat. The oh, okay, okay, I got it. Thank you. It is yes. It's just a horrible way to do it, that's all. <laughs> but yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, and that's the only one we have working right now. And the same on, so this guy, actually I can, I can show you that. Uh, I have it here. So yeah, so I'm going to quit this set. Just to show you, I'm not lying. If you, if you, please. <laughs> okay, hold on, hold on. It's it's sleeping. It's it's uh, it's in low power mode. Uh, and, uh, I guess. Okay. Let me retry that. Yes. Here we go. So we have Linux booted. So uh, this thing only has uh, eight megabytes of SRAM. So there's 
not much left and I can't even get a proper uh, init process to initialize the, the thing because that forks one shell which is going to fork other shell and then I run out of memory. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm doing it like this but you can see it's uh, No, I'm in Linux. So second Linux capable rich five bar in the world. You can do much. That can be. Okay, so that I have challenges, be. challenges for people here. So this one is like the, the smallest one. This is a $6 one, not This is a $6 uh, yeah, one. Yeah, that's like the, the $5 yeah, one. That's the one all of so the So out there, the same, same SOC, you have a version with wireless. So anybody can shove in a, a wireless stack <laughs> into the kernel. <laughs> On 8 megabyte of SRAM and get it to run, I'll be super happy. And you have left like. <laughs> you did it? <laughs> Sorry? Uh? No. No, so right now it's all, uh, it's all a single image, so the unit for MFS is uh, single image loaded. So that's a something we're working on with, with uh, Christoph. So if we get the spy driver, we can put everything on the spy card and it's going to be way easier. We can save uh, more memory because the, the kernel itself is actually using only 900k or something. So it's, it's very small. So we have, we have room to play, but it's just that we put everything into the single image. It's killing us right now. Show me the proc memory info. Oh. <laughs> uh, and the interrupt. Wow. Wow, yeah, 2.3 megabyte. megabyte free. Yeah. yeah <laughs> and the uh, proc interrupt. Uh, okay. Just, just you, you just can. How, how many you can show me? Huh. Uh oh. Interrupt. Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh oh. So, uh, be kind. The device. For, it's a horrible hack to get it okay. to that state. Okay. It's. It's nowhere near fully supporting what the, the, the thing can do. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I think, yeah, basically the clock and the, the serial is the only one to enable right now. It's 62 bit, isn't it? But ESA is the no, RV. 62. No? no, it's a 64 bit dual yeah, core. 64 hardware. Yeah, second. There is a U554 in, in this chip. There's a dual core, 64 bit, uh, with five CPU and more. Well, no, uh, no, 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 no. It, it says it has S mode. Uh, so if you look, it's actually so you can actually sh uh, switch into S mode. Uh, okay. But if you try to set up a page table, it's going to blow in your face. <laughs> it's just going to I reset. Don't, I don't think it's it's Sorry. Yeah. No, no, there, there's uh, clearly no MMU, that's for sure. If you, if you touch the vegetable thing, you just reset. So they they actually back on, SciPid now has a decent uh, online store. Uh, SciPid now has a decent online store, and so the, the wireless version, uh, the, the one that has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, it's like 20 bucks. And you get the, the display and the camera with it too, so it's everything. If you, you can you can even get the L C D to work on this thing if you want. Oh. Okay, so that's all I had. Uh, just a quick update on the this work. He said you only have two MB, not two minutes. Hmm? Uh, I'm waiting for challengers. I mean <laughs> <laughs> So uh, things going on with that. So this is really no, it's actually a kernel 5.1. It's not even rebased on the latest uh, Christoph work. Uh, a lot of the code for, for supporting to the hardware comes from the SDK from Kendrat, which is Apache 2.0 code. So I'm not releasing any of that code for now. I have to get rid of all that, clean things up, and I'll put the patches available somewhere for, for people to start playing with that and eventually upstream. Uh, OpenSBI last week, we were merged, I think yeah. we merged. Uh, so I did the work 
on OpenSDI for the serial uh, to get rid of all the SDK code that I had copied there. Uh, the same so can go into now the kernel. And the additional thing that is needed for this, the minimal uh, thing is to turn on the PL1 to get the extra two megabyte uh, of SRAM that is normally used for the AI accelerator chip that they have in there. So that, that's the other part uh, of the SDK that needs to be fixing on this one. Have you or anybody else gotten JTAG going on these? No, I haven't tried. I've wasted a lot of time trying to get it going. It doesn't so work. I was hopeful, okay. Is it the <laughs> same JTAG? Um, is it a RISC-V perspective? It, yeah, 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 it's just yeah. actually getting anything useful out of the probe. Yeah, so, so you, you Um, okay. That's all. Any questions? And uh, uh, about the user Linux uh, and uh, user Linux. In, fi in fact, I want to share my experience of the user Linux, and and uh, that's my not my job. It's my colleague's job, and uh, several years ago. Uh, and uh, our customer wants to let want to let let us try the use use Linux on the this guy, and uh, it, at that time we think it could save memory, but when we finish the job, we find it at the most potent challenges is the uh, how how to put the uh, uh, separate the uh, process name area, and uh, you need to put a lib to the area and some put the ELF to the some area. But uh, when we finish the job, we find it will spend more memory because because there is no M MMU supported. And uh, and uh, when, when, when the customer wa want to uh, set up some complex things, this complex, this, this, this things, this, uh, this open software is put, is worked with the GDPC, with the standard Linux and uh, if you want to customize in a very deep, that will cost a lot, a lot of time. Just easily porting to the UC Linux and it, and it seems usually make worse on the memory well, spending. Yeah. I, I would say uh, from experience working with that, it depends how you compile it. There are different options. So for example, for the, the, the bin flat, uh, the obvious thing to do is just statically uh, uh, compile link uh, everything into your, your executables. But you also have the, the shared bin flat. So you, you get basically uh, one, one image of the, the library that is <coughs> shared so dynamically loaded uh, also together with, with the process. For FDP, you, you basically have the same. You can do static or, or dynamic linking. Uh, it works uh, in dynamic linking case. So it's going to load the, the library first, and the library becomes a loader for the for, for the the actual uh, binary yeah. uh, application. I mean, yeah. so depends how it's compiled. So I can't really comment on any specific, but uh, yeah, yeah. But it, I if you do it properly, it's 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 not different basically than any normal. Yeah, I just uh, share you with my failed experience. Yes, we try to use this Linux, but it failed. And uh, that porting is reviewed by me, uh, and I now I, I still don't don't put uh, no MMU support to this guy, because I think uh, this yeah, is not uh, very I mean valuable to and uh, to, but uh, but that's a very person personal idea, okay, personal opinion. So opinion. I'd say no MMU Linux dates back; to, it's really old, and uh, I guess it it was it was worked on because at the time the concept of Arcos wasn't really around, and you had nothing like this. So you needed a scheduler, here you go, you need to MMU. These days, really, it's, it's as I said, okay, we can, so that, that's why we're having fun doing it. That's not the end goal, but it doesn't really make sense to run Linux on this thing. Yeah. And Arcos is just more than enough uh, for, for whatever uh, you want to do. But uh, I don't know, is Christopher still in the room? No. But <laughs> You could think of, of more uh, advanced uh, advanced use cases, like on your PCI accelerator card. Uh, you have a, a very decent uh, RISC five core there with lots of memory. You could put the non MMU Linux to to schedule whatever acceleration work or, or thing you, you want to do there, yeah. potentially. And uh, another reason is uh, 
the hardware is no cheaper and cheaper. That means, look here, this kind of chip, only $2, and it's shipped with the 64 megabyte. Yeah. That's, that's only $2. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and I think with the MMU, uh, MMU equipment will be the very best equipment of, of uh, Linux to run, yes. run Linux. So, but, but, but I, 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 don't, I don't mean that's work is not valuable, but I think it's, uh, uh, I can share you our, yep. our, our field so uh, experience. Uh, uh, another uh, another interesting- That's a cool demo, yeah. Yes, another uh, interesting thing we should be probably looking at uh, with this work is things like Unix boot, for example. Like disentangling the no MMU stuff from the M mode stuff would be really useful. So it, it is there. So right now, M mode equal uh, no MMU, but we could separate. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But because then I we can boot regular Linux in M mode. Yes. Right. Which is a useful thing to do. Yes. Right. Like that. There are people who want to do that. Right. So it's actually the config option right now is is. Uh, Check, I think the latest is M mode, not okay, no MMU. Okay, all right. Thought, all right, I haven't looked at the latest one then. Yeah. Can you tell us something more specific? You said no MMU, call no MMU speed, but uh, you didn't config call no MMU, you said config M mode. Yeah, and the config M mode disable so it says, uh, sets config no MMU. Yeah, I think that's not quite. Right. Whatever, so I, I need to yeah. check again what Christoph okay. did, yeah, uh, we'll but we'll it, it's it's there. I mean, it's it, there are the two options, so yeah. we can we work with them. No MMU could success, and uh, I think there uh, and uh, I think there are a lot of rich OS, rich Atos users will change the use of Linux. But why there is so many rich Atos here? Zephyr, Archfraid, or a lot of rich Atos because because mm, without uh, use, uh, no MMU Linux couldn't uh, do. Could, could, couldn't have some disadvantages than this at all. RTO is rich RTO kind of. Yeah, well, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm and not the competition, sure. yeah. Linux with rich RTO. Maybe the, we, we want to bring the Linux down to the IoT area and the compete, uh, compete, the, compete yeah. with the rich well, RTO let them. To get there, there's a lot more work to from, do. From, from my view, <laughs> that's RTO just, just, uh, just uh, do some Motor, mo motor, motor control. Some, some, not, uh, not too ram complex things. Yeah. yeah. Take the ram and just dump it down. <laughs> <laughs> S ram. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>